Hello and welcome back to the Metropol Grid. My name is Andre. Thanks so much for tuning in. The System Gateway review series continues and today we have eight NBN cards to talk about and I believe two neutrals depend on the end. If you don't know how the series works, we're going to be diving into each and every NBN card released in System Gateway and taking yeah, a deep dive into the lore and flavor behind these cards, but of course also how these cards work and interact with one another and what sort of strategies they work well within. Now, of course, these cards came out in System Gateway, and there's a lot of new players and viewers who are new to Netrunner through System Gateway. How's it going? Welcome. Um, we'll be talking about these cards within that meta, so how these cards interact within just those 75 new Netrunner cards you might have just picked up. But of course, it's also worth noting that these cards are a legal part of the standard card pool, which is the big competitive Netrunner card pool of the last four or five years. So we'll be trying to talk about both camps and well, there'll be a clear division where you can tell what we're talking about. Hopefully something for everyone. On top of that, there are timestamps in the YouTube time bar. So if there's a certain card you want to jump to, go ahead and scrub through that. And while we are going to be talking a lot about tags today, it is worth knowing, unrelated, that if you do like this sort of content, uh, if you want to like or subscribe to this video or to this channel, it greatly helps the Metropolitan Grid grow. Cool. So we're talking about NBN today. So just like most other videos we're doing, let's stop by the, the Nisei's Learn to Play Corp page and do a little storytelling uh, about their blurb, what they say about what NBN is. So NBN is the world's largest news and entertainment conglomerate. No matter what you do, you do it through NBN. It's where you get your news from, where you find information. It's how you talk to your friends. It's what you watch, what you play. NBN's augmented reality spaces are all that stand between you and the harsh reality of lunar living. It even educates your children. This generates vast amounts of data, which is sold to generate vast amounts of revenue. Through these platforms, NBN has rendered itself indispensable for life not only on Earth, but beyond it. But NBN's greatest claim to power is so ubiquitous it becomes invisible. All public network traffic goes through them. Meddling with their media stranglehold is a dangerous game. You may find your bank account emptied, your healthcare void, your level 73 warlock suddenly deleted. But that's fine, right? After all, how could you live without them? That's an awesome blurb. And NBN is, I think, a really fun corporation uh, to talk about just because uh, I think it's easy to relate to the content, and their strategies and what they do. Because modernly, I think if you're watching this video, you are inherently at interacting with that sort of information and in big tech. Now, when Android Netrunner was rebooted in 2012, Fantasy Flight Games was working with the Android IP. And the Android IP, based off the Android board game, there was only two corporations within that game. It was the war between Genteki and Haas Byroid. Now, Lucas Litzinger, the lead designer at the time, his job was to create multiple factions, more factions for the game. And in the words of Lucas, he said, how can you have a game about information without having an information company? So NBN was created and seems like a very nice and uh, obvious inclusion into this sort of game. Now, quickly talking about the name NBN, actually, it stands for nothing right now. Based off of the lore wiki, it says that the NBN, uh, those letters stood for different things throughout the history of the company. At first, it was Network Broadcast News, then Net Broadcast Network, eventually Near Earth Broadcast Network. But now NBN stands for nothing besides NBN, which is pretty wild. And NBN, again, they cover so many things. Just being a media company, they have their hands in so many pies when it comes to basically the broad consumption of media across huge fields. So just like they said in the blurb, it started out with news. This was the original core set identity, making news, which is a pretty scary uh, subtitle there. Uh, when it came to another card breaking news here, uh, sometimes a runner found themselves in the news and that generally doesn't work out well for them. And that was a, a strong thing, a strong theme within NBN, the idea that they own the news. And of course, controlling the message is a very powerful thing. Harpsichord Studios represented their uh, film conglomerate. This showed up in the Sand Sand cycle, specifically in the old Hollywood data pack. And it shows NBN making good old films. Explodapalooza, maybe a sequel at this point, but uh, they create what we consume. Full Immersion Studio or Rec Studio, excuse me, just kind of just shows you there's a thing called a Sensi films or Sensi's within the Android universe. And these are 4D or 5D films. They're generally, I think, I think you experience them in virtual reality and they're films that not only have sound and visuals, but also should stimulate your other senses. And they show some dancers here, I think recording there with their VRS helmets. 
On top of that, gaming is now a big part of NBN. And this actually only showed up in the Nisei uh, cards. So this is GameNet, the sort of augmented virtual game space. And you see a lot of other cards that explore that. When it comes to the daily questing, giving a target and a daily goal is, is very good for both the runner and the corp, but also loot boxes. Yay. Uh, on top of that, education shows up. This is Asmari EdTech, currently a banned card in the standard format, but if you educate, uh, there's a lot of money to be made in that. And Amani Sanai is the, the Android character right now who is meant to be one of the best teachers and instructors in the NBN world. Now, there's a lot of interesting sub themes too. Jackson Howard, it's hard to talk about NBN without talking about Jackson Howard. He was this toy maker who made these uh, particularly invasive edutainment toys. And uh, he at some point ascended within the ranks of NBN as an executive. And he made these things like Dinosaurus, the old console of chaos theory. And this was a, a mixture of surveillance and on top of that, uh, education. Augmented reality is something that comes up a lot. And we'll be talking a bit more about this reality. Plus the NBN identity in gateway is an augmented reality thing. We also have advertisements, which is a fun sub theme of NBN stuff. Some of the, uh, the advertisement ice is some of my favorite ice within the whole game. Yeah, it's a media company and they control everything. And it's important to know too, they control the pipelines that everything else goes through. And this is like a very natural segue, I hope, into the other big thing that NBN is known to doing, known to do, excuse me, which is tagging the runner. So tagging is basically the in-game uh, equivalent of the, the corporation understanding where the runner is and who they are. And tags can be a very scary thing. And NBN was classically, if I'm not mistaken, I think in the old core sets, the only faction that can distribute tags. And that's largely still the case. There are some out of faction cards that do that, but NBN is the tagging uh, faction. So city surveillance was a cool example, both in theme and in mechanics of they're going to find you. And there's a lot of ice within the NBN card pool that won't end the run, but it'll do these sort of observing, tracing things to figure out where the runner is. Turnpike is a really cool example of it. And it's not just ice. There's so many things that can tag you. Cards like Seasource used to be in the card pool that just said you interacted. We'll find you. We're going to spend money tracing you, which you might not know what that is if you are only playing System Gateway at this point, but we'll get to that. And modernly hard hitting news says, oh, you've ran. Here's four tags. I'm sorry. The news hits hard. On top of that, we have Sync, which is just an identity that deals with tags really well, controlling the message, another incredibly competitive tag-based identity. Tags are a really solid thing within NBN. And it's not only giving tags, it's also leveraging these tags in some very scary ways. This is closed accounts. This used to be this, one of the strongest, well, specifically in faction, tag punishments in the game. We know who you are. We're gonna drain your bank account. And it's very hard to win a game of Netrunner when you don't have any credits. There's other cards like All Seeing Eye that say, we can see you, your jobs, your connections, they're all gone. We're going to isolate you from everything else you know. An exchange of information, a very potent win condition that just swaps the agendas around. There's also interesting things like Keegan Lane, a sysop who can trade tags for destruction of, of programs, which can be quite scary. I think another sub theme, and this was very, very, very strong when the game came out for the first couple of years of Android Netrunner. Right now it's less of a thing, but fast advance. Fast advance is the term Netrunner players generally use to describe scoring an agenda out of hand on the same turn. So after script pilot program on its own, it's a three, two with a token, but if you score it, it gives you this agenda counter to place an advancement token on a card that can be advanced. So your next after script pilot program, you can install advance advance, and then without a click, use the pilot programs hosted agenda counter to score the next Astro script pilot program. And you see how this kind of rolls out of hand. This was the Astro train and it very quickly leaves the station. On top of that, we have cards in the standard format. Right now, Sans and City Grid is in system update. Uh, this is a very strong uh, tool to score agendas out of hand. And you have other things like calibration testing, a very similar card to Sans and remastered edition, which is the modern reimagining of the one the now rotated AstroScript pilot program. There's also interesting things like psychographics, which is this nice marriage between tags and fast advance. And it's always worth noting that NBN is the one faction in game as if the runner's uh, very tagged, they can score one agenda to win the game. A 13 point Beal, or sorry, the 13 advancement Beal is worth seven points. And there's some other ways to fast advance too. Things like focus group are modernly available as well. 
I think the one last thing I want to mention is there are things called asset decks, decks that generally don't run a lot of ice, but run a lot of assets. And instead of building strong remotes, they just build various remotes. And that is something in the modern format that NBN can do better than anyone. Uh, Near Earth Hub just entered the standard rotation and Near Earth Hub has a lot of influence and builds remotes very quickly. And you also, of course, still have controlling the message, which makes those assets very difficult to trash. The last thing I want to say about NBN is I think in terms of theme and flavor, they're one of my favorite in the whole game by a large margin. And that's because, again, I just find a lot of their theming and flavor and mechanics really fun and really interesting. Sweepstake is not a card in the standard format, but it just it's such a nice uh, marriage between mechanics and, and theme. The idea is that if you as a runner are consuming a lot, you have a lot of things in hand, the corporation can monetize that very easily. If we know who you are and what you like, we can probably sell to you a bit better. And I think one of my other favorite things is these sort of punishment cards like this is just a flavor thing. But the idea is that a lot of times how NBN punishes you as a runner is they make you the star of a reality program or suddenly swap mid-season and the runner finds themselves to be the star of some sort of investigative journalism. And that is disgustingly, it's like monkey paw-esque sort of fame for some runners. I think it's just mechanically really cool to see that's the way that they attack. They leverage the news and publicity and they control public opinion. And it's a really interesting thing, a really scary thing to mess with NBN. I think also finally, whenever I'm explaining what the game is in Netrunner, I talk about what agendas are, and I'd be hard pressed to not mention that one of the agendas in the game is a company trying to put their logo on the moon, which is just so buck wild. But that is a good explanation, I hope, I hope it is, of what NBN is. They are the media company, they control the information, they want to tag the runner, they can fast advance agendas out, that's not as strong as it used to be. And they have a lot of interesting tricks when it comes to ads, and, and uh, eh, that's mostly it. But they're really fun. They are really fun, so let's talk about how, what they look like modernly within System Gateway. And what a place to start, then their identity, Reality Plus. This is NBN Reality Plus. It is a megacorp identity as a minimum deck size of 40, just like all uh, identities within System Gateway, 15 influence. And it says the first time each turn, the runner takes a tag, gain two credits or draw two cards. Why settle for real? And some lovely art by Emilio Rodriguez, who did, I believe, all the corporation arts. And I think this is my favorite in the whole pack. So just in terms of mechanics, or not mechanics, in terms of flavor, what's going on here? And you can kind of see it with this tower projecting these sort of, there's a bit of chromatic aberration, but these trees and these buildings, uh, this is all augmented reality. And you, we talked about it a bit in the Nisei blurb, but the idea here is that what the moon looks like, what uh, basically like what lunar colonies look like is nowhere near as nice as this image. And NBN is spending its time and technology to project and make an augmented reality that makes life on the moon look a bit better. This is the sort of augmented reality, right? Uh, this is a video called Hyper Reality by Kichi Matsuda. This is just on YouTube. And this is kind of their like visualization of what a world with incredibly strong or incredibly uh, oppressive, maybe augmented reality looks like. And it's 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 quite something. So if you want to read more about that, Ilks Forbin wrote it's a very short uh, kind of lore article. This was released during spoilers uh, month a couple months ago. And this one's a lovely read. Check this out. But it talks about the idea of that augmented reality on the moon. All right. So let's talk about reality plus within a uh, game of Netrunner. So this text, the first time each turn, the runner takes a tag, gain two credits or draw two cards. So let's just talk about the reward here real quick. Having a choice between gaining two credits or drawing two cards is really powerful. Now, of course, we need to figure out how often this can tag people or can tag runners once per turn. But let's just say you can tag consistently. Gaining two credits or drawing two cards is a very powerful ability. Firstly, we've seen an ability like this before. Sports medals, go big or go home is uh, has a very similar ability. It says whenever an agenda is scored or stolen, gain two credits or draw two cards. And uh, this identity just recently won Worlds. It's a very powerful identity and they will build decks. Uh, Corpse will generally build decks with a lot of small agendas to ensure that this fires very often. And the big strength of Sports Metal and the big strength also of Reality Plus is the Corp can always choose the better of two options uh, based off of their current board state. Gaining two credits or draw two cards are almost always both universally good, but be able to pick the best option at any moment is uh, it, that's definitely very relevant. You are making the choice. So let's talk about this. Gain two credits. Is that good? Yeah, it's always good. 
In system gateway specifically, money economy is not as robust as if you were playing with in a standard format with a bigger card pool. So gaining two credits when the runner just takes a tag is it's just always going to be valuable. And having more money is very important because most of the economy cards in the game or just resin your ice, things in this game cost money. Having money is really good. So that's always going to be good. The other thing is drawing two cards. And that's also very interesting. And a big part of this is the 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 basic idea that if the runner is tagged, there's going to be cards in your deck that punish the runner for being tagged. And one of the best things you can do when the runner suddenly becomes tagged is drawing cards to be able to find those cards that punish the runner for being tagged. And there's a couple cards, like things like Retribution. This is a card in System Gateway that says if the runner is tagged, do something awful. And the idea is that if the runner goes ahead and takes a tag and he don't have a card that punishes the runner, it gives you a chance to draw into it. And it makes that tag a lot scarier. You have a bunch of other options, Predictive Planogram as well. And we're going to be talking about all of them. But the idea is that if the runner is consistently taking tags, you're both going to ensure that you have either the money to play your tag punishment card or you're going to draw into your tag punishment cards. And both of those things are quite good. Now, it's important to, if we want to see how good Reality Plus is in System Gateway, let alone outside of it, we need to understand how often this identity can tag runners. If this triggers only two or three times in a whole game, that's not a lot of value. If you can trigger this every turn in the game, oh my god, can that be quite powerful? And this is the list of cards within System Gateway that can give tags. It's seven cards. And I'd argue actually that some of these are quite good. I don't think they're all built equally. I think Funhouse is probably the, the biggest contributor to how good this ability is. We'll be talking about almost all of these within this review, barring maybe Pharos. But it's worth noting that we're only working with seven cards. And if you're playing uh, Reality Plus, you have a really good incentive to play as many of these as possible to ensure that your ability triggers once per turn. Now, of course, it's interesting because if you stack two of these in a row, say two ice to give the runner a tag, you're only going to get benefit off the first time a turn. So to some extent, you want to spread these out in some way, if you know what I mean. But um, yeah, I think there's enough ways to consistently give the runner a tag for Reality Plus to be considered uh, good, interesting, reliable. And we're going to be talking about most of these cards individually again within this video. Now, the next question is, and this is really important, is what cards within System Gateway punish the runner for being tagged? And this is a very interesting question. And there's only three. There's only three cards within System Gateway that will punish the runner for being tagged. And this starts the big conversation within uh, System Gateway is, as the runner, should I spend time removing tags? It's important to know, if the corporation gives you a tag, as a runner, you can spend always a click and two credits to remove a tag. And the question is, if you start taking on tags and you see you're playing against a Reality Plus deck, should you just go what people call tag me and just take on every single tag and not worry about them? Or should you spend the very valuable time and money to remove the tags? And I think if you look at this three cards here, you can kind of make the decision pretty easily for yourself whether or not you want to go tag me or you don't want to go tag me. Now, we'll be talking about all these cards in a second, but I, I think that's that's one of the, and I'm going to say issues right now with NBN within System Gateway is that I feel most of the time as a runner, you can just take tags. You don't have to clear them. And most of the time you'll be okay. Because I think the punishment that exists within System Gateway uh, to punish a tagged runner isn't that robust or that scary. I'm not that worried about most of the stuff. And it's a lot of stuff you can specifically play around. Now, I do want to say in the benefit, specifically Reality Plus, one of the cool things about this identity is that even if the runner doesn't remove tags, it's, uh, it's still going to be a relevant ability. The idea of the runner now has seven or eight tags and they're just running through your ice and taking more tags, at least you're going to almost, well, you're more likely to get your two credits or two card draw a turn. So that's in some ways good. Maybe other parts of your strategy will fall apart, but the idea that this still fires if the runner decides to take on the tags, that's definitely very relevant. So should you go tag me against this? Or shouldn't you? Let's talk about the three cards. Or I think maybe we only talk about one or two of those because we're going to be talking about these specifically, these uh, predictive and orbital later on in the video. So I think one of the scariest reasons why not to take tags within System Gateway is the existence of a one influence, one cost card called Retribution. Now, this is an Whalen card pool. Again, it's very easy to put into any NBN deck. And the idea is that the runner is tagged for only one credit. You can trash something and you can trash programs or hardware. And if you trash hardware, you can trash a console and it's very hard to trash a console. I think this is the only way within all of system gateway. And that can be interesting. This could rob a Lou deck of a lot of power. It can maybe goof up someone's MU, but trashing consoles is interesting. 
I think the thing that this seems most exciting is trashing icebreakers. A lot of decks only have two of a single copy of an icebreaker. So if you can trash a buzzsaw and maybe earlier in the turn uh, the, or in the game, sorry, the runner has discarded the other copy of buzzsaw because it seemed redundant, they might play the whole game without any buzzsaws. And that could be a problem. But honestly, I'm not sure if it is. I think in System Gateway, there's more than ever. And I think than any... Um, core set type experience we've seen. There's a lot of cards that give you flexibility to deal with ice outside of just having the specific ice breaker for that type of ice. Anarchs have access to Botulus, which lets you them get through ice regardless of strength or regardless of the subtype. You have Mayfly within uh, System Gateway, so it, it's not a, a permanent solution, but if you really need to get through that remote and they just trashed your Fractor, this is your Fractor now. And you even have access to cards like Tranquilizer, which maybe are a bit slower, but does give you an additional way to deal with ice. I think, though, the biggest thing, though, you have to understand as a runner playing against NBN, specifically in System Gateway as a Reality Plus deck, is they're going to be playing Retribution. So one of the best things you can do is don't discard extra copies of your breakers, because if you do end up either not by choice or by choice, taking on a tag, uh, them trashing your buzzsaw is going to be a problem if you discarded your other buzzsaw. So that's a very important thing as a runner to keep extra copies. And maybe even if you want to deck build conservatively, play extra copies of your breakers in your deck. Don't think I only have one and I can fetch it with a, a mutual favor. Maybe play, I would always say at least two, but you could even maybe play three. I don't know, maybe that's too much, but that's the idea. This is one of the biggest card punishments in System Gateway for taking on tags. And if you just play multiple breakers, it's not that big of a deal. It's also worth noting if the runner is tagged as a basic ability, the corporation can always spend a click and two credits to trash a resource. And these are the five resources that, that exist within System Gateway. And it's kind of a mixed bag of what you do want to trash. It's important to know that it's expensive to trash resources. Maybe, maybe Reality Plus just got two credits, which kind of offsets the cost of trashing a resource. But I, I think the one here that I'm most excited to trash a lot of the time is Verbal Plasticity, just because card draw is really thin within System Gateway, and this is a very powerful card draw card within the format, and it's also kind of expensive. Cards like Cookbook might not be that relevant in the mid to late game when they've played most of their viruses. Red Team, yeah, if you can trash it, if there's a lot of money on it, so be it. Telework Contract also might only have three credits on it, and I'm not a big fan of Smartware Distributor. But it's another big reason why a runner might not want to take on tags, regardless of a corporation's tag punishment cards in their deck, is because they like the resources. And I don't think any of the resources in System Gateway are as necessary that you build your entire game plan around. And there are a lot more in standard format where there's a lot of runners that are dependent on one or two resources for their whole game plan. But System Gateway decks are a bit more straightforward, and you can lose a red team and you'd still have a fine Zaya deck. You, you will lose money, though, that's for sure. Now, we'll be talking about the other tag punishment cards, but this is a recurring theme uh, that's kind of a shadow, the way I see it, over the NBN card pool within System Gateway specifically, is that the tag punishment isn't that severe. And this is a huge departure from learning to play Netrunner with the NBN card pool from some of the old core sets, where you had incredibly strong punishment for floating even a single tag. If the runner ended their turn with a single tag, boom, closed accounts, one credit. You have nothing. You go down to zero credits, and it's so hard to get up. Uh, to, it's, it's so hard to recover from zero credits in Netrunner. Most of your economy cards cost you a bit of money to play. They can play closed accounts, and now you have no money, and then put an agenda behind a piece of ice that they know you can't afford to break. Like That was a very, very strong punishment card, and something like this doesn't exist in System Gateway. Scorched Earth was, oh my god, even a bigger deal. The old uh, core sets had a card that said, if you have a tag for me damage. So there's a lot of decks that would just give you a tag and play Scorched Earth, Scorched Earth, and that would be good game. And that was the basic, the idea of every single Wayland deck in the old core set, and it was very, very, very powerful. So um, it's very different when it comes to looking at System Gateway where there's three cards that care about tags, and none of them are just like a very obvious win condition. They all require extra steps. They require the runner to have maybe thrown out extra breakers or not playing extra breakers or scoring an agenda. Like they're all way more difficult and don't represent strong win conditions as they used to. And it's worth saying, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I think it's really interesting that the designers and Nisei want to change the value of what a single tag represents, because that's kind of the issue. Back in this old Netrunner, a single tag meant a lot of the times death. 
And then it didn't really matter how many tags the runner had and all this sort of play space was ignored. It just became very binary. Tag equals death. A lot of times people wouldn't even bother playing closed accounts because they could easily just play Scorched Earth and then all the other tag punishment or tag interaction cards didn't matter because you could always just say tag equals death. And that's way more reasonable or way more directly powerful than, well, I'm going to close accounts you and then hope I have an ice that you can't break because it ends a run and then you have no money and then I'm going to put an agenda behind you. Like, why do any of that when death is... It seems good, you know? So it's worth noting that they're changing that and they're rolling back the power level of a single tag. But I think from most of my play testing is that you can still float tags as long as you're not dead to retribution, which again, maybe the corporation can just continually play retribution over and over again. And maybe at that, that point you'll be in a bad spot. But again, there's just so many ways to deal with ice. Oh, that's not the right slide. There's so many ways to deal with, with ice in, in system gateway that it's hard to lock out a runner. Now this changes, this entirely changes once you go out of system gateway and you need to go to a, a bigger card pool, say like in standard, because there's some very relevant tag punishment. All seeing eye says all your resources are gone. And again, in standard, there are more decks that rely on their resources a bit more than within system gateway. This can be incredibly powerful. More powerful than that is exchange of information that can say, okay, you're tagged now. I'm going to take my one point agenda and swap it for your three point agenda and then just get rid of the one point agenda. That's huge. That's game winning. If the corp is on four points or five points, they can just usually swap their way out to a win. Uh, you also have other cards. Market forces is the closest we have to closed accounts. It can ruin your money. And uh, if this is better if the corporation or sorry, if the runner has multiple tags, not a single tag. And one of the best things, like if you can just add a single card to System Gateway to make NBN so much more powerful, I think I would just pick Psychographics. A single Psychographics stops the runner from wanting to go fully tag me because if they have four or five tags, you can start scoring agendas directly from hand, fast advancing five, three agendas. They send a message, boom, two clicks, install Psychographics. And just a single card like this, totally opens up the way that runners have to play or not opens up, closes it down the way that they have to play against reality plus where tags actually matter. And again, there's other things. Keegan lane is really interesting in the standard card pool. It can trash programs in a, a retribution esque way. You quantum predict a model an agenda that you, they can't steal. If you're tagged, let alone they give it to you. And of course it's not scorched earth because it's not a single tag, but there's still a lot of ways to kill the runner. High profile target is now five influence and it gives you two meat damage for every tag the runner has. And then if they have two tags, boom can be lethal as well. And that's a really big deal. Again, things look really different with a bigger card pool because you have more tag punishment and generally stronger tag punishment. So I'm less likely to want to float those tags against Reality Plus. It's also worth thinking in uh, the standard card pool, there are more ways to tag the runner. And we didn't talk about most of those in System Gateway. We'll be talking about them throughout the review. But you have cards like AR Enhanced Security. If you score this early, basically once per turn, or uh, it's, this is, yeah, the first time a turn that the runner treasures a corp card, they're going to take a tag, which means you get two cards or two credits. That can be very powerful. You also have cards like Hard Hitting News, which is the easiest way to bury someone with tags. If you have a bit of an economic lead, you say, boom, take four tags. I'll draw two credit cards or get two credits. And even traps. Traps are really fun. Snare is so cool, especially when you fire snare for two credits. When you get your two credits back from um, Reality Plus, that can be quite nice. Cards like See You. Uh, again, maybe you don't know what Trace is. We'll be talking a bit more about this throughout the video. But the idea is that you can give the runner a tag as a surprise before your turn even starts. You have funny cards like Eavesdrop that, again, makes one piece of ice really scary to deal with. And then maybe you have more money to fire things like Forced Connection, which gives the runner two tags. And things like Prysac. Like, this is, this is all good stuff. And it's really hard to play around all of this stuff. It's not that difficult to ensure that the runner is getting tagged pretty consistently. Maybe they won't end their turn with a tag. You'd have to work a bit harder for that, but uh, there's a lot you can do. Oh, I totally forgot there's more stuff I have here. News team. <laughs> News team can be worth negative agenda points. Generally, people take that. Otherwise, it can be really bad for them if they take two tags plus all your Reality Plus stuff. There's a lot more ice that interacts favorably with tags. Maybe because if the runner's tagged, you'll get your money back as Reality Plus. You can spend more money boosting into the trace on IP block because that money is refunded. Again, in some ways, Reality Plus can be played like a making news back from the old core set. Authenticator is really fun. If they want to take a tag to bypass this undercosted high strength ice, it's going to be really good for the corporation. And Hydra gets even cheaper if this fires and gives you that seven credit refund potentially with Reality Plus. 
There's also some other ice that you could consider. This is mouseless. It's a really good tagging ice. It's a bit of influence, but in Wayland, that's good. And you have Sync Rerouting, a new lockdown card that is um, uh, it can make those runs pretty difficult, at least for one whole turn. And it's worth noting, and I think I've said this before, but one of the beauties that you see that's a bit different with Reality Plus than some of the other decks is things like Sync or controlling the message which generating the standard card pool is that they the, their ability becomes incredibly irrelevant once the runner decides to go tag me. And the idea that it's abstractly kind of cool is, again, reality plus if the runner still goes to take more tags throughout the game, you're still going to continue to get more value. And I don't think there's an identity like that with it right now within standard card pool. Now, if, to some extent, that doesn't 100% matter because a lot of these decks, if the runner does go tag me, the game is not that much longer because a rocket shows up, but that is technically true. If the runner goes tag me, it's very hard to go tag me against Reality Plus because every time you take on a tag, they draw two cards and they gain two credits and then they're closer to playing that boom or drawing into that boom, which is a really big deal. Now, the last thing I want to say about Reality Plus, and I've been saying this about every Corp Identity, is it's a 40 card minimum deck. And we haven't seen that in NBN for a while. The last time we did see it is Asmari EdTech, which was a 4015 similarly, and this is banned because back in the day it played a really strong game and it ran only six agendas. In a 40 to 44 card deck as a corporation, you only have to play 18 to 19 agenda points. So back then they would play three Bolognas and three uh, other really good 5-3 agendas and they would score two of them while the runner had to find three of them uh, before they could win. They had to steal half of the agendas in their deck. Now, as a corporation, if you score two of these, that's only six points, but NBN has access to the echo chamber, which for your whole turn can be that seventh point, which the runner can never really steal. They can only trash it. So that was what the deck was. It was a small deck that ran very few agendas and the runner needed half of them. And that proved to be a very hard thing to deal with. And uh, it's, the Asmari ability is obviously very good as well, but um, you can now do that again. I'm interested to see if that does see play of uh, the 5-3 deck. Uh, and uh, that is largely my thoughts on Reality Plus. Um, I, I think it's interesting. I, I think it's a potentially a very strong ability. It also lets you go fast, again, uh, getting free card draw and, and trying to rush out the runner, getting that money back for doing the thing you wanted to do anyways. That's quite nice. Now, within System Gateway, and I think we're going to repeat this a fair bit throughout this whole review, I feel like the tagging plan isn't 100% there. And I feel like if the runner plays intelligently, they can take on almost all the tags they want, and they'll be fine. Still, Reality Plus will be making... We'll be making bank or drawing cards throughout that, but uh, it's it's not as um, they're going to struggle a bit more because a lot of their cards give tags. And once those cards don't have that much value because the tags aren't a fear to the runner, it might be a bit difficult to clear uh, to end a game. Cool. Let's talk more about tags because we have a three two agenda every identity, every corporation, mind you, within System Gateway received a three two agenda with this limit one per deck clause. And this is tomorrow's headline. Three advancements will get you two points. It's an ambush subtype, generally the most fun subtype of cards in Netrunner. And it says, when this agenda is scored or stolen, give the runner one tag. Limit one per deck. Flavor text says, we don't find news. We make it. That's a really cool reference, perhaps, to the old original making news identity. Uh, the exact same idea. We're making the news. So again, maybe we're doing this backwards, but the idea is that this is a really nice card because when stolen or scored, it will fire Reality Plus. And you're definitely going to play this in System Gateway. The 3-2 agendas are quite good, three out of four times. And so this is a really exciting card uh, because it's just going to be good. And it's going to fire your ability just about every game that it shows up, either stolen or scored. Now, this is cool because this is a, like many of the cards within System Gateway. It's a reimagination, a reimagination and a, like a conglomeration of two existing cards. Uh, this is kind of a, a merging of TGTBT, a 3-1 agenda that when accessed gave the runner one tag and fly on the wall, a 3-1 agenda that when scored gave the runner a tag. So uh, fly on the wall, I think is a card that looks very powerful, but doesn't see a lot of play competitively because it's very difficult to slot into a deck. The idea abstractly with a fly on the wall deck is you want to install advance, advance this behind uh, some ice and then the runner decides, okay, either I can't run it or maybe that's a Bologna and I can't steal it. It's pretty difficult to steal this thing or it's an NGO front. And if I run it, it's going to be a huge swing of credits. And so maybe at some point 
you, the fly on the wall goes through. On your next turn as a corp, you advance the fly on the wall, you score it, the runner has a tag, and then you have two clicks to do some horrible things to the runner, exchange of information. Now, the big reason why that hasn't been successful for a long time, fly on the wall as a 3-1 agenda. 3-1 just isn't a good combination of numbers on an agenda. It is a lot of credits for not a lot of points. And on top of that, because this card doesn't take up a lot of points, it, because it's only one agenda point, it increases the amount of agendas you have to play in your deck to hit the minimum agenda count. And it, it just doesn't work out very well. It's, um, it's very hard uh, to find a deck where this is uh, potent. And so far, competitively, we haven't. And maybe I'm not talking exactly about System Gateway, but tomorrow's headline just fixes that. It's a 3-2 agenda that when you score, it gives you that fly on the wall ability and then gives you some time to uh, give some punishment to the runner. And also if it's stolen, that's fine too a lot of the times because again, maybe those that tag punishment will come. I think my favorite thing about tomorrow's headline is that while you could score it out, just put it behind a nice next turn, advance, advance, advance. It isn't the worst because it gives the runner a tag and then still on their turn. And again, mind you, if you're playing reality plus, you'll gain two credits or two cards. So again, this is kind of like a one cost, two agendas, uh, two agenda points is that the runner still, if they want to not go tag me, has to spend a click and two credits removing the tag. That's a relevant ability. The idea that you score this and it robs the runner basically at three to sometimes four credits of potential play, right? Like it's two credits and a click. That's a lot of money. A lot of times that's three to four credits if, you're, if your deck is efficient. So that's not too bad. But then this gets very interesting where you actually can install an advances to other play patterns. Maybe you install advance to tomorrow's headline and the next turn you do advance, advance, and then you play some punishment card like retribution. Like you can set that up. I think this goes really well with Seamless Launch, a very strong card within System Gateway. The idea is that you can install this and then next turn Seamless Launch advance, and then you can have multiple clicks to, again, hit somebody with some retribution. And that's quite good. Now, again, another interesting thing and potentially maybe even the strongest part of this card is that it's going to give the runner a tag when they steal it. And that is wild. Like, it's so hard to play against that. It's kind of like a snare. And when you're playing against a Jateki deck as a runner, you understand there's going to be snares in the deck and it changes how you play. If you're playing outside of System Gateway, mind you. The idea is that you don't want to run last click because if you run last click and find a snare, you're going to end your turn with a tag. And if you end your turn with a tag, the corporation can maybe trash your resources or maybe play some tag punishment. And tomorrow's headline has that same sort of ability. If you run this late last click on a turn, you're going to end up with a tag and then the corporation has the whole turn to do some horrible things to you. But the difference between tomorrow's headline and snare is that tomorrow's headline is a one of in the deck. It's it's so much harder to play around and the fear of the existence of tomorrow's headline can have a huge impact on how runners play, but also it's very hard. Like the amount of respect that this card could elicit for only being a one of in the whole deck is just wild. Like I, I think a lot of runners won't respect this card because it's not going to show up that often. But there's some times where it does show up. You jailbreak HQ last turn and suddenly, oh my God, you have a tag and then you've lost something important to you. Like that is incredibly powerful. It's a very hard to respect this card as a one of per deck. And if you hit it late in the turn, like horrible things can happen to you. It's 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 wild. I think there's going to be you're going to see so many plays. In, in system gateway or in, in standard format even where there's more agendas to worry about that uh, you're going to run, someone's going to run archives at some point, just checking archives last click and steal this and be like, uh oh, and then something horrible is going to happen to them. And it's, it's very hard to play around a one of per deck. On top of it, in system gateway, you can make this a bit meaner. Again, you can put this on maybe an amaze amusements. We'll be talking about this card later on in the, in the video. But the idea is that they run this. Suddenly there's three tags and that's really hard to predict or deal with when you just ran two face down cards and suddenly it's, it gets really bad really fast. Within standard format, again, it holds that same weight. It's a real threat. It's a real trap. And on top of it, again, price tech is really flexible. And if somebody runs a remote late on the turn, maybe hits a tomorrow's headline and a maze, a price tech, something like that, they suddenly have two tags and then boom is a real thing. It's another thing where you could play this in a deck with snares and you can set up so many situations where they run at a wrong time and end up with multiple tags. It also works interestingly with false lead and false lead is pretty wild. The idea is if the corporation has a false lead scored, if the runner runs on click two, and runs uh, R&D or HQ or wherever and hits a tomorrow's headline, you can say you've lost the rest of your turn. And then you can ensure that you start the turn with them tagged and then you can deliver some nonsense. So I think it's really cool as a threat. And as a 3-2, like you're just going to play it regardless. Even if it was blank, a lot of times 3-2s are really good. And that's a big reason is that NBN can fast advance 3-2s out really well. 
Sense and City Grid came back to the standard format. This used to be in the original core sets. And now if you have a Sense and City Grid on the table, you start your turn, you can res it, install advance, advance, score your tomorrow's headline. And now you've just scored a 3-2 without any threat, without having to leave it on the table for a turn. The runner not only has to deal with the Sense and City Grid, or you might score more agendas next turn, but they also have a tag to deal with. And so now they have a couple of things they want to juggle. On top of that, you have access to remastered edition and other things like calibration testing. It's kind of easy to score three twos in NBN if you want to really go into that deck and you can run four three twos in an NBN deck easily with Project Beals. It's a really strong agenda. And I think unlike the last agenda we talked about, the, the Genteki agenda, this one will show up as a one of in just about every competitive NBN deck going forward. And that's a big deal is the 3-2 works really well with some of the NBN cards. It's a trap. It's good when you fire it. It works with tag punishment cards. It slows the runner down if they steal it. It just checks off so many boxes for being a very relevant effect. And in System Gateway, again, you don't have access to a lot of agendas. You're definitely going to be playing this one if you're playing NBN. It's quite something. Speaking of quite something, this is Spin Doctor. It's a unique asset. It's a character subtype. It costs zero to res. It says when you res this asset, draw two cards. Then, as a paid ability, you can remove this asset from the game to shuffle up to two cards from archives into R&D. There's a quote. It says, it's worse than dead meat. Your project is too toxic to even feed to the vultures. If you don't want to join in, if you don't want to join it in the bloody memory hole, crawl onto every business show you can and wallow in blame like a pig in muck. Now, I don't have any confirmation, but I've heard from multiple people, and I agree that this art image here looks a heck of a lot like the character Malcolm Tucker, who uh, you might have seen if you watched The Thick of It, which was an Armando Iannucci uh, series on the BBC. It was a political satire uh, played by Peter Capaldi. And uh, Peter Capaldi's character, or sorry, Malcolm Tucker, the character, was a director of communications in both the government and opposition, acting as a prime minister's chief enforcer overseeing cabinet ministers. Armando Iannucci writes these really creatively vulgar characters. And if you ever watch Malcolm Tucker or listen to Malcolm Tucker, it becomes very clear this man is very good with words and very just a lot of bile comes up very quickly. A very fun character. I've only watched the first series of um, The Thick of It. And maybe you've actually seen Armando Iannucci's other stuff. If you watched Veep, that's the second kind of like the unofficial follow up to it. Veep is very quite good. I've, I've seen all of that. Another really fun thing as Spin Doctor, again, as Peter Capaldi went on to play the Doctor. So we actually have the Spin Doctor Who, which is quite fun. Now, this is probably the strongest card within System Gateway, full stop. This is basically um, a reprinting or a reimagining of one of the strongest cards in all of Netrunner history. And again, I know I've said this a lot throughout uh, the System Gateway Review series, but this one is, it's true. It's true. There's a lot of really strong cards reimagined within System Gateway. And this one was Jackson Howard, the toy maker. Jackson Howard has a very similar ability. It was a card that was very easy to include into your deck for one influence, zero res, and it let you draw cards. And then very importantly, at a paid ability window, let you take cards from archives and put them back into R&D. And this is just such a valuable and flexible ability, and we'll be getting into it. But I just want to show you as an example, if you search Never DB and you search Jackson Howard and you look through the deck lists, like it's not just NBN decks, it's every single faction. And that was because back in the day, how you built deck lists was you put three hedge funds, you put three Jackson Howards, and then you built the rest of your deck. Like having a deck that had less than like it was the most ubiquitous card of the time. And it was so scary at the point that this card was rotating out of standard format because all of the players, myself included, were so used to playing with Jackson Howard and saw the values of Jackson Howard in the game that we were scared the rotation, a world, a Netrunner world without Jackson Howard would be so much worse. It turns out it wasn't. We were fine. We didn't need Jackson Howard. Maybe the whole time it was within us. But uh, Spin Doctor represents a different Jackson Howard. And even if we didn't need Jackson Howard, oh my God, is he back? So it might not be obvious why Spin Doctor is such a strong card. And one of the cool things about this card specifically is that th there's so many ways it can be used. And there's so many circumstances in which it's very powerful. And this card alone, uh, it incentivizes or it encourages like it allows people to express themselves with how they play with the card. It's just such a flexible card. The way that you use it and the way that you play against it as a runner, 
there are so many options and there's a lot of creativity and there's a lot of uh, player expression how this card is used. It's a very flexible card. And I think on that merit alone, this is a very exciting card uh, to be back in the format. So firstly, let's talk about, I'm not going to talk about exactly, well, maybe we'll talk about the differences, but firstly, Spin Doctor is a card that draws you cards. When you install this, you can choose to res it whenever you want at any paid ability window and you draw two cards. And drawing cards is pretty good. It, it's a pretty good thing to do. It speeds up your game. Again, if you need to find things in your deck, if you need to find your economy, your breakers, your upgrades, there's many point in time in System Gateway where you just think like, oh God, I just wish I had a hedge fund. And a lot of times this will just help you draw into it. And that's a really big deal. Another thing that's really cool is that this isn't like predictive planogram where it doesn't take a click to draw three. You can do this whenever you want with any paid ability. And that actually technically makes this a trap card. Uh, you can put this into a remote server and the runner might think I need to run this because it looks like in any agenda largely within system gateway that you could score out with something like seamless launch. So the runner runs it, they pay money, they get through ice and right before they're access, going to access the spin doctor, you can res it and draw two cards. And that's really cool to have something to put into a remote server that a runner spends some time to interact with and maybe money, and then you still get value from it. Like, that's really cool. Now, interestingly enough, drawing on your on the runner's turn might not be the way that this is played all the time, because one of the most powerful abilities of Spin Doctor is to remove this asset from the game to shuffle up to two cards from archives into R&D. And this ability is recursion, for sure, but the way that it works with the drawing ability is one of the strongest parts of this card. The idea is with Spin Doctor, you can have a terrible hand. Maybe your hand has multiple copies of, a, of agendas in it on after you mulligan the early game and you think like, oh, I have no money, I have only agendas, I have maybe one piece of ice. You can install Spin Doctor. You can res Spin Doctor drawing up, so maybe now you're at eight cards, and then maybe install a piece of ice and then click for a credit. And then at the end of your turn, you have to discard down to your hand size so you can take those two agendas and you can throw them into archives. And now they're perfectly safe. Because if the runner runs archives where there's now maybe six or four agenda points, you just add a paid, any paid ability window before they access archives, you remove this asset from the game and shuffle those cards back into R&D. So that was a big part of Jackson Howard and Spin Doctor is that it lets you fix bad hands. If you're looking at your hand and saying, this is not what I need right now. I have too many agendas. I wish I had money. You can freely draw into more cards. And then when any extra cards you have, maybe there's agendas you want to get rid of, you throw them into archives, and then you'll be able to safely shuffle them back. It's a really strong ability uh, to be able to do that. It, it's, it stops people from losing to agenda flood, which is kind of like the, the mana screw of, of magic. And it, it's nice to have a very easy card to put into your deck that, that helps you to deal with that situation that might be very frustrating and hard to deal with as a corporation. As a corporation, if you draw five agendas on your mulligan, you're probably going to lose that game. And this is one of the cards that lets you deal with that. Now, it is worth knowing there's so much nuance on how this card can be used and the, 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 how to play around it as well. First thing that is worth knowing, if you have Spin Doctor in a new remote server and the runner runs it and you use this, the Spin Doctor to remove this asset from the game, if there was no ice in front of that server, that server ceases to exist. The run is neither considered successful or unsuccessful. So if a runner like Penny Shaver has a Penny Shaver and runs a remote with just a spin doctor and then that server disappears, they're not going to gain a credit. And forcing the runner to interact and run is actually a really cool part of spin doctor. A lot of the times the corporation will use spin doctor to throw agendas away into archives. And now if you're trying to win a game that say the corporation has six points worth of send of messages in archives and a spin doctor on the table, it's very hard to win off of R&D or HQ when there's six agenda points basically out of the game. So it is in your best interest to either run archives to force the shuffle from Spin Doctor or run the Spin Doctor to force the Spin Doctor to be used before running archives. Or sorry, before running R&D. So now the agendas are back into R&D. It's also worth knowing sometimes you can like run R&D, see the top card, and sometimes run Spin Doctor or Archives, force a shuffle. Then you can run back on R&D and see a new card because R&D was just shuffled. As a corporation, you have to keep that in mind because a lot of times you think, okay, if the runner's going to run R&D this turn anyways, maybe I'll pop my Spin Doctor early so they don't see two fresh cards. Admittedly, though, now the deck has more agendas in it because you just shuffled them back in. So there's some really interesting things. Also, because you can pop this at any paid ability window, say that you have an agenda in hand and the runner drops a Docklands Pass and they're running HQ, you can pop the Spin Doctor and suddenly draw two cards. And now you have seven cards in hand and maybe it's harder for the runner to hit the agendas. Admittedly, maybe you drew into two agendas, who knows? But 
That's also a really big thing. There's just so much flexibility with how you use this card. On top of it, there's other abilities within uh, System Gateway where it works well with. Anoetic Void, it lets you recover some of the cards you've thrown out from hand to, to fire the Anoetic Void. It also lets you draw cards quickly to, to be back up to hand size to help firing the Anoetic Void. It's also a really strong card when it comes to Jinteki restoring humanity because it allows you to quickly draw, discard cards, and even put agendas in archives to get money with them. And if the runner runs archives, you can bring them to safety. There's a lot of reasons why you want to play this card. It is so good. It is so immensely good and flexible, and there's so many ways to play it, and the runner has to play around it smartly. Generally, it's always going to tax a click to run archives to force a shuffle or to run the spin doctor. Now, it is worth noting within System Gateway as well, there is Sprint, which is also very easy to put into your deck and even easier to play. It only costs zero and only one influence, and it lets you draw three and shuffle two from HQ into R&D. And it is worth noting that if you are just using Spin Doctor to uh, to carve agendas out of your hand and put them back into R&D, a lot of times Sprint is actually much more uh, better on clicks. It's, it's more efficient. You spend one click to do that instead of drawing and then spending the next part of your turn ensuring that you have seven cards at hand so you can discard some. So Sprint is worth looking at. And we also did talk about Spin Doctor as a card to be able to rescue agendas, but it is worth noting you don't have to recur agendas with this. A lot of times I am just recurring, okay, seamless launch. Instead of allowing the runner to pay two credits, which sometimes it is right to let them pay two credits, you can just say I'll shuffle in a seamless launch and a hedge fund, right? Like that's fine too. It's honestly not too bad. It's a really good card and it only gets better in standard format. In standard format, there's way more ways that you can make this very strong. Interestingly enough, this is actually one piece of art. Spin Doctor, I believe, is on the far right of the Daily Business Show art. Uh, but Daily Business Show is a very strong card. It is in System Update 2021. And it says the first time you turn, you would draw, draw an additional card, and then put one of those on the bottom of R&D. And because it says the first time each turn, you can use Spin Doctor to draw on the runner's turn to draw three and bottom one. That's really strong. As Daily Business Show shows up in almost every NBN asset deck. Political Dealings is nice and fun. It says when you draw an agenda, you may reveal and install it. So you can use Spin Doctor and res it at the end of the runner's turn to install a 3-2 agenda and then spend your next turn scoring it off. Anything that loves draw, loves Spin Doctor, Ginger City Grid, you put the Doctor in there, you res it, you draw two cards, suddenly that's two ice, you're off to the races. Mass commercialization, any strong card, Spin Doctor represents more recursion. You can play that same mass commercialization over and over again until I leave the JNet lobby. And border control, anything that's really strong, again, it lets you put it back into your deck on a card that is good on tempo. And this is a really big deal because classically in standard format, a lot of corporations would run a single copy of some sort of recursion card. But cards like Preemptive Action were good, and they recurred more cards, three is bigger than two, but they were bad on tempo. They were also very tricky to play because it's hard to use Preemptive Action to save agendas because that agenda generally has to be in archives because you can't play this after you discard cards because it's operation, right? Like basically you either, you have to get the agendas into archives and either leave them there that turn or do something very creative. And Spin Doctor not only helps you deal with those agendas more easily, but it is an on-tempo way of saving you. Not only are you getting recursion, but you're getting card draw, and you're forcing the runner to interact with you. It is quite something. On top of it, it also works really well with other things like Stargate. Playing a Stargate deck against a deck that has the Spin Doctor on the table, it's so difficult. You Stargate R&D, then you get a card into archives, they run archives, you rescue it with the Doctor, and it's you just shuffle the deck, they don't know what you're drawing, it's... It's, it's, it's really difficult, and on top of that, Insight doesn't see a lot of play, but things like this are, are really difficult to deal with. Um, I think that's also another thing that's really important to know. This is a card that lets you shuffle your deck. And a lot of the times, one of the best things, well, not the best things, but a very powerful thing that the corporation can do, or sorry, the runner can do, excuse me, is uh, something called R&D lock. The idea is that if I've Stargate the corporation, I've trashed one card, and now I know the next two cards that the corporation is going to draw. So I can ensure a lot of times that the corporation is not going to draw into an agenda unless they spend most of their turn drawing. And that makes it really hard for the corporation to win the game if their plan is to score seven points of agendas. And that's a really cool thing about Spin Doctor is before your mandatory draw, you can pop the Spin Doctor, shuffle in one card if you really need to, and then get a new card draw. You're drawing fresh cards that the runner hasn't seen. Now, to some extent, that can be bad because you've just shoveled R&D. So if they're locking you with something like Conduit, they're going to go in and see more cards. 
But it is a cool panic button to say like, okay, well, I've seen the top two cards with Stargate maybe, and I know what those are. I'm going to pop to shuffle to draw maybe an agenda or something I need right now. There are a lot of edge cases in which shuffling the deck is a very powerful ability. Now, how is this different than Jackson? This is a conversation that's probably more important for people who've been playing Netrunner since 2013, but there are some key differences. Jackson Howard represented an ongoing threat. The difference with Jackson Howard, if Jackson Howard is on the table and you didn't deal with Jackson Howard, either by running archives or running Jackson Howard, the corporation still had the ability to click to draw two. And that means if you're playing an acid matchup, uh, a sort of corporation that wants to put a lot of things on the board and go horizontal, you needed to stop them from drawing a lot of cards because a lot of times their turn would be Jackson Howard, install, install. So you need to deal with Jackson. And I'd argue Spin Doctor is less, it has, it's not as important to deal with as quickly, barring the fact that it's hard to win the game if there's multiple agendas in archives, but it's, Jackson Howard was a bit more threatening. That being said, Spin Doctor is technically better on clicks because Jackson Howard was click intensive. To get the free card draw with Spin Doctor, well, it's free. With Jackson Howard, you have to install it and also spend a click. So you're committing more of your turn. Albeit though, you did draw four. You could do install Jackson Jackson to draw four, really flesh out your hand. You still have the ability with Spin Doctor. If you install Spin Doctor Res, draw, draw, you still end up drawing four. So it's about the same, but Jackson Howard gets scarier the longer it's left on the table. Another big deal though is Jackson recurred three cards. Actually, firstly, Jackson is three to trash. Spin Doctor is two to trash. That is technically a nerf, right? Uh, but Jackson Howard recurred three cards while Spin Doctor only recurs two. And that's actually a huge difference. A lot of times back in old Netrunner, you would recur maybe two agendas. And then that third recursion with Jackson Howard, you put back just a good card into your deck. Well, actually, fully operational wasn't legal back then. But this is my example of what a good card is, right? And a lot of times with Spin Doctor, you're going to put two cards back into your deck. And those are going to be two agendas. It's really hard. It's a lot harder to get that incidental value from Jackson. A lot of times also Jackson Howard would recur two agendas maybe and then a third Jackson Howard that the runner trashed. And it, it's much harder to get more value out of Spin Doctor unless you're only saving one agenda. So that's interesting. But overall, I, I, Spin Doctor still, it feels very similar and does a lot of the things. And it's a bit more tricky considering this when you res draw two makes, makes it a much better bait in remote servers. This is showing up as a three of in just about every competitive deck I've seen since System Gateway released, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Now, I think it's easy to complain about that and say like, oh man, this is a ubiquitous card, everything's homogenous. And I don't feel that strongly about that, the same way that I don't feel strongly about Rashida Yahim being boring and homogenous because Rashida shows up in most decks. And that's because cards like this enable you to play better Netrunner. I like Rashida because she gives me cards and credits. She ensures that I'm doing something a bit more aggressive, I'm not too slow, and then I'm waiting for the runner to run over me. It gives me plays. It also makes it interesting where things in remote matter, even if it's not just an agenda. And Spin Doctor is the same idea. It's a very flexible card that accelerates your play. It ensures that you can get to your game plan. It ensures you don't lose to agenda flood and things that you might think are outside of your control. And that is a good thing largely for the game. Now, that being said, it does mean that most competitive decks are basically at a three influence deficit compared to their NBN uh, kin. And maybe that's an issue. But for what it's worth, we know that we can build competitive decks not needing three Spin Doctors. And the question is whether we still want Spin Doctors anyways. And it looks like we do. Now, is there any cool way to play against this as a runner? And there is. There's some really cool options. Political Operative looks really, really strong right now in System Gateway. And uh, you can get this down. And then throughout the game, if they res a Spin Doctor, you can always trash it. And there's some really interesting interactions here. It's worth noting that Spin Doctors draw and remove this asset from the game, those are paid abilities. Rezzing and removing this asset from the game are both paid abilities. So if a political operative is on the table, the corporation can still res the spin doctor and immediately use it before the political operative player has time to trash it. Now, admittedly, if that pressure is on, you're not forced to use the political operative, and then you'll almost never use the spin doctor to recur or to protect agendas, because you can just draw two and then have to use it immediately. So that's quite strong. But I think one of the coolest things about Political Operative is if there's a Spin Doctor rezzed on the table and say the corporation has four points of agendas and archives, if a runner runs HQ, some corporations will trash their Spin Doctor before access even. Because in theory, because it's the runner's turn, after the run on HQ ends and the corporation doesn't have a paid ability window, the runner can immediately install political operative and then immediately pay the trash cost of a res card to trash spin doctor. Because it's the runner's turn, 
They can install and do as many paid abilities as they want before giving uh, priority back to the corporation. So if there's a spin doctor on the table, the runner can run HQ, ask the corporation if they want to do anything. They might be confused. And then you install a political operative, pop the spin doctor, run archive, steal four points. So I have seen at the high tables, corporations respecting and popping spin doctors when a runner just simply runs HQ, which might look really bizarre to the uninitiated, but it's a, it's a, it's a very smart calculation of threats in place, especially at higher tables where you might know what's in your opponent's deck list at like top eight cuts or whatever. Now, this is fun. Uh, I just want to talk about Divert Power. There's another card within System Gateway that works well with Divert Power. This is an, one influence card you can put into your deck, but I have seen lists that are actually de-resing Spin Doctor because it's only zero to res. And when you res, you get two cards and then de-resing other cheap things to res their expensive ice. And that is quite cool. I think that's really fun with Spin Doctor is to get extra value, extra card draw. And then you end up saving like, I don't know, nine credits and res a free toll booth and de-res like a pop-up window. I think that's really cute. But that's Spin Doctor. Oh my God, look at Malcolm Tucker. It's, it's, it's creatively obscene, but uh, a very, very strong card. And you're going to see this in just about everything on the competitive list within System Gateway. It does a heck of a lot of work. Now, Sprint does exist within there. There's no reason not to run both. And I think there's a lot of decks that will run both because Sprint does do something similar to Spin Doctor, but it's very good. And it's very important to learn how to play against this thing because it's, uh, it, it is something. And uh, both sides. There's, there's a lot of creativity with how you play with this card, and I think that's a really good thing. All right, we got some ice here. This is Funhouse. It is a Codegate ice in NBN. It's five to res, four strength, and it says when the runner encounters this ice, end the run, unless the runner takes one tag. As a single subroutine, it says give the runner one tag unless they pay four credits, and then quote in the flavor text says, I might take a break of VR after this one. Signed, C of Ribaldry, Sensi Streamer. Ribaldry is a great word. So I was playing System Gateway against my partner, and she looked at this art, and she immediately thought, oh, that's Greg Davis. How do they put Greg Davis on a piece of art? And I think that's amazing, and I can't see any other thing now when I look at this card. If you don't know, Greg Davis is an actor, comedian, uh, British actor. I watch, well, we watch a lot of Taskmaster, and maybe it's the eyebrows, or maybe the fact that we can now only imagine... Uh, Alex Horn here on uh, at the outside of the ice, but uh, it's great. I really like this art and this theme here, the fun house. And we see in some other cards kind of links into the other Nisei uh, NBN stuff with this kind of the game net, this beautiful place for runners to play. And I think that's that's really cool. So this is like a lot of other cards in System Gateway, a reimagining of a very central NBN card that's been around since the core sets. And this is Data Raven. Data Raven was a sentry. It cost four cuts, four strength, and had the same text at the top. When the runner encounters Data Raven, he or she must either take one tag or end the run. Now, first things in terms of formatting, there's no he or she pronouns. That's sick. And then it says host a power counter, give the runner one tag, and there was a trace to place a power counter on Data Raven. So the interesting thing about Data Raven and the interesting thing about Funhouse is it breaks some of the central rules you might have learned when someone taught you Netrunner, which is ice, you interact with ice, you break subroutines, you choose not to break subroutines, and uh, that's it. And Funhouse and Data Raven existed outside of that space that said, if you encounter this ice, regardless of whether you're breaking it or not, it can goof you up. It doesn't matter if you have the proper breakers, it's going to give you a tag if you want to get through it. And that makes it such an incredibly taxing ice. Because even if you have the best breaker in the world to deal with this, you know there's still going to be a minimum of a tag to give to the runner. And that tag can be really big. Of course, this is a huge deal in Reality Plus, where every time they go through that fun house, you're going to get two cards or two credits. That's sick. And this is so good that this is going to be a single card you can put on R&D or the remote server or HQ. I'll name all the servers, really. And uh, the, you know that the runner is going to have to go through that thing three or four times a game. So you're you're basically guaranteed to get your, uh, excuse me, your Reality Plus pretty often. It's one card that ensures Reality Plus fires multiple times. That's awesome. That's really good. So let's talk about Funhouse. Obviously very important in Reality Plus, but how good is it as an ice? It's different. And how different is it than Data Raven is also a very interesting question. And firstly, one of the problems about Data Raven and Funhouse is that when the runner runs this, the corporation pays five credits to res this, and the runner can choose to end the run. And choosing to end the run on a five credit ice is pretty bad. Like a lot of times I'll run into Data Raven, and I'm even happier now that the Funhouse costs one more credit as a runner. And they'll res it and just end the run. 
And paying five credits to do nothing to the runner besides end the run, which Ballista does sometimes, that's a really bad trade a lot of times for the, for the corporation. Five credits is a fair bit in System Gateway. And not having to deal with like, you know, even Pharos gives you a tag at a minimum or, you know, like there's a lot of ice that does something when the runner face checks us. This is like, oh, you paid five credits. Yeah, cool. I'll go run the other remote server now. Like that is a big problem with Funhouse. And it's kind of the balancing act between uh, it makes this thing a lot weaker, albeit it is very strong when the runner decides to go through it. And that's also a balancing thing on this card too. Even if you don't have a breaker at a minimum, or excuse me, at a maximum, you're going to go through this for a tag and four credits. And sometimes even just two tags, which is, you know, a problem if the runner's going to tag me. But I'm saying if you want to go through this and you want to actually deal with the subroutine, at most, you're going to pay four credits. That lines up pretty well within System Gateway. If you want to break this with Unity, Best case scenario, you're breaking it for two credits once you have your breaker. Again, you're still going to have to take the on-encounter tag. With Buzzsaw, it's four credits, so it doesn't matter if you have your Buzzsaw or not. Again, that math changes incredibly as soon as you have a single leech. And with a single subroutine, this is pretty susceptible to Botulus. And uh, that can be quite something when you're getting through this for a tag and for free. But again, the ability here is that it gives the runner a tag whether they want to go through it or not and whether they want to break it or not. And that is very strong. We've seen cards like this before. Tollbooth used to be in the old core sets, and sure, Tollbooth is still very expensive to get through, but the, the win encounter is going to hit you no matter what. Even if you botch a list of Tollbooth, you're still going to have to pay three credits, and that's a nice way to keep the ice relevant, regardless if the runner has cool tricks to deal with it. And this adds up really quickly, right? Like the idea is that the runner doesn't want to go tag me. You can ensure that the runner is going to have to take multiple tags if you put an anoetic void behind the funhouse, and that's pretty wild. They have to go, they have to run it twice, three times. You're going to have to take three tags. There's no way around it. And that's unfortunately where specifically within system gateway, this ice kind of falls apart to me. Like it's definitely very good in uh, reality plus because it ensures that you trigger your ability over and over again. But just like we said, when we talked about the identity at first is there's not a lot of reasons to fear tags. And this ice totally falls apart if you just take tags. If the corporation pays five credits for this and then you say, okay, I guess I'm going to tag me. Sure, the Reality Plus is going to fire the, if it's the first funhouse you've gone through the, through the turn, but you break this for absolutely free. And that's kind of the problem here, right? Like it, you, go, you go through this for free and that feels really bad. So you need to make sure that you have a plan to close the game quickly and you don't. I don't think in System Gateway if the runner takes tags. On top of that, this also doesn't end the run. So it's not like you can retribution their decoder uh, and you know in your deck, if you're playing Reality Plus, you're going to have three copies of Funhouse. So attacking the code gates is also not a great thing because this will never end the run if the runner is going to tag me, which is a problem. There's also another big difference between Data Raven and Funhouse, and this is maybe more meaningful outside of System Gateway, is how Data Raven worked. There was a trace. And I guess it's a good time to describe what traces are. In Netrunner, there are things called traces. The Nisei designers want to make sure there were no traces within System Gateway to keep it approachable and just basically lower the overhead of uh, like keywords that you needed to know to learn the game. But basically how a trace worked is traces, like this one says trace three, the runner has, uh, sorry, the corporation initiates a trace if the subroutine fires and it starts with a base trace of three. Now the corporation can choose right now to pay any amount of credits to boost their trace by as many credits as they spent. So the corporation could say, okay, trace three, I'm going to pay four credits, and that makes it a trace seven, three plus four. Once they've decided how much they wanted to trace, and again, they don't have to boost. If they wanted to boost nothing, it would still be a trace three minimum. It goes back to the runner, and then the runner would look at how much link they have, and link is something that is technically written on cards. Uh, I'm just going to open Tau Salonga. It's technically what this number would be in the corner, that two boxes interlinked. So all the runners within System Gateway have zero link, but you would look at the runner's link, which is written on their card and they could install other cards to boost it. And their base trace would be their link. So Tau has zero. They have no cards to increase their link. So it started zero. And then they could choose to pay a credit to boost their trace. So say the corp spent four to make trace seven. So then the runner would have to pay seven credits to be able uh, to make that trace unsuccessful. Basically, if you tied the trace or exceeded the trace as a runner, the trace was unsuccessful. I feel like I got a bit that fell apart a bit at the end, but that's the idea. You threw money at each other and uh, whoever spent more was safe or was in danger based on what side of the table you were on. So that's how Data Raven worked. And Data Raven had the same problem with Funhouse and maybe problem isn't exactly the right word, but the idea was that this trace three, well, this would be really scary if the corporation had a lot more money than the runner, but inherently 
the runner could always decide to end the run when they hit the data raven. So they would only be initiating that trace if they consented to it. So you will never find yourself in a situation where you run the data raven and be like, uh oh, trace is starting. I have three credits. The corporation has 20 because you had to consent to that trace to fire based off of how data raven works. Now, Data Raven is a lot stronger in terms of a tag card because the thing with Data Raven is that when the trace is, if it's successful, you get a power counter on the Raven and then you can choose to use that power counter at any point in time during the game to give the runner a tag. And Funhouse only gives a tag on the spot. And that means if the runner just wants to let this fire because they don't want to pay four credits, they could always spend a click and two credits later in the turn to clear a tag. And maybe that's difficult because Funhouse is going to give you two tags if you go that way because of the on-encounter ability. But it means that if you have time and money to clear the tags, Funhouse is not going to catch up to you. But that was the difference between Data Raven. If Data Raven fired and you got the power counter, the corporation could now fire that power counter at any point in the game uh, and then deliver an exchange of information when it's going to win them the game. So the difference between having a tag now and having a tag whenever the corporation wants it makes, makes Data Raven a lot scarier. On top of that, like... Scorched Earth was a thing, so the tags were a lot scarier, and we've talked about that before, but that's a big difference. And really, though, eh, a lot of times that trace wouldn't fire. You would not You would never let that trace fire, but you were more scared of it than this one. In theory, you could take the tag and clear it. Now, there's also a big change here, and this is really relevant in, in, in the standard format, is that Funhouse is now a code gate, and Data Raven was a sentry. That's a really big deal. If you look at the standard card pool, if I'm not mistaken, there's only seven sentries that NBN can play. And I think a lot of them are not very good. Well, some of them are, I think, unplayably bad. New Sound doesn't make any sense because the currents are banned. Thoth is pretty rubbish. Syncabriary is okay. But if all these sentries that see play consistently, it's just Turnpike, F2P, and sometimes Hydra. Those are the ones that see play competitively. And having Data Raven as a sentry that could see competitive play in most NBN decks was a big deal because now as Funhouse is a code gate, you might notice that NBN has twice as many code gates as sentries and a lot of the code gates are very good. You really want as a corporation to play a, a different, a spread of different types of ice, code gates, sentries, and barriers to ensure that the runner needs to find and install all of their breakers, which does slow them down. And losing a good sentry that for what it's worth, didn't require a breaker, but losing a good sentry um, kind of and gaining a code gate just doesn't make that much sense within the NBN card pool. I think you'd rather have a good sentry if you could. On top of that, this is, I think, a, a more sprawling problem when it comes to looking at Whalen decks. This is an Argus security deck. It's a, it's a Whalen identity that really cares about tagging the runner. And a lot of these decks would run three copies of Data Raven because it's the, the best tagging ice in the whole game. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of good sentries right now in Wayland. And now if this list has to run three fun houses instead, the sentry slot is like really weird. And there's not a lot of good solutions for it. Maybe we're playing Veritas. But it, it represented the strongest sentry in a Wayland list that now lost its strongest sentry. And that's kind of a bummer. Now, it's weird to talk about breaking, like the differences between breaking Data Raven and breaking Funhouse, because a lot of times you didn't actually end up breaking Data Raven. You'd only have to break Data Raven if the corporation had a lot more money than you, because if you had more money than the runner, or sorry, if you had more money as a runner than the corporation, a lot of times you just pay the trace and you get through. So in theory, Data Raven was expensive to break with MK Ultra. And now Black Orchestra, which is one of the most common decoders in, in the uh, and our card pool, breaks Funhouse for three anyways. And again, you always go through this for four. Now, a cool thing about Funhouse is that it does work with some other cool stuff in NBN, and that's positional ice. The idea is that you can ensure that when the runner goes through the Funhouse, they're going to have a tag because of the on-encounter. So if you put a Funhouse in front of a data ward, that is quite the server. You have other things too, like F2P, which are really fun because these are strong subroutines, specifically if the runner's tagged, it's harder to deal with this. And you have cards like Quantum Predictive Model, which if you put behind a Funhouse, wow, it's, it's going to be safe for a while because if the runner's tagged, they can't steal this. And that's great. Not only can they not steal it, but you get it. I'm going to find any excuse to talk about Harish Chandra, which is a pretty rubbish identity. But the idea is that this is a consistent way to see the runner's hand. And that's kind of cool. And in sync, Funhouse is really scary because if you go through it and take a tag, that tag is three credits and a click to clear. That's a lot of money. Uh, and again, this is going to show up in just about every Whalen deck. And again, just like we saw in Argus, it's going to show up in all these sort of Wayland decks. I want to get a credit advantage, go quickly, and then hit you with the hard-hitting news and then bury you with, with death, with high-profile targets. So that's a thing. This thing will see play. I think making it a code gate was definitely not a good trade. 
Um, I think the fact that it costs more obviously is not good. And I think within System Gateway, this ICE is going to be the workhorse for triggering reality plus his identity. But once the runner goes tag me, you're going to realize three copies of your funhouse become useless within your deck. And that's a bummer. Also, you do have hunting grounds within uh, within uh, standard card pool. And this did show up pretty consistently in uh, a meta that had a lot of data ravens and other on encounter ice. So if you're frustrated with these uh, fun houses, a hunting grounds will deal with one per turn. And then you can just break it for four credits, which is quite nice. And yeah, I, I think I was saying this before, but this is a very big deal that you find out in system gateway. And sometimes you can see this as exciting or not. But if you do end up putting like multiple fun houses on R&D, it might be in the runner's best interest to just put down a conduit and go through it and just say, I'm hoping to win before these tags matter. And they generally can, besides if you retribution the conduit. But that's very different when it comes to um, the standard card pool where the tag punishment is a lot stronger. We have another piece of ice. Man, I like this ice a lot. This is ping. It's a two credit barrier and only one strength. And it says when you res this ice during a run against the server, give the runner one tag as a subroutine and the run. Oh man, I love this ice. This is really cool. It's actually one of my favorite cards within System Gateway. On its own, it is a cheap and the run. And while you do have Palisade and System Gateway, cards like this are very important because a lot of times in the early game, you can go a bit fast. You can get an agenda. You can put it in front of something that ends a run like a ping. Maybe you have a seamless launch. Maybe you advance this. And that means that you can score out an agenda relatively early. There's like this ebb and flow to Netrunner games where in the early game, the runner has to find their breakers. And then it's basically a nice time to score an agenda. Maybe you put two ice on a remote server and score behind it. Maybe you have a code gate and a barrier. And this is a really nice barrier to score out early. And a big thing about this barrier too is that it has a good punishment right when it's rezzed, which is more relevant in the early game. Say you put that off-world office behind a ping and the runner runs this, firstly, in reality plus, that's nice. You either res this for free or draw two cards. That's really good tempo as well. And then the runner thinks, okay, I res the, they res the ping. I don't have a breaker. I'm not going through it. And now I have to clear a tag, which slows down their early game. They can't really install resources very safely because you can trash them. They probably are going to spend some clicks to remove the tag. Maybe they don't because the early game is not that, there's not that much punishment. They can't get their things retribution if they don't have things. Uh, but that's really good. The fact is that it's a face check and it will end the run if they don't have the proper breaker, but also give them something to worry about. Imagine this card says, end the run, the runner loses a click and two credits. That's quite something. Admittedly, it's only the first time it's rezzed. Otherwise, though, breaking it, it's going to cost you one or two credits. It's Marjana. It's Cleaver. Maybe you get Botulist just for free. I wouldn't Botulist this. It's really low strength. It's really easy to break, but... The idea is that it has this really good window when it's really strong, which is in the early game. And I still think throughout the rest of the game, it's pretty relevant. This is something I really like. And Border Control, a lot of people feel strongly about this card because it's very powerful. But I really like when Ice isn't only just subroutines and strength. Because if it is subroutine and strength, it's just a mathematical, uh, it's a mathematical calculation of is this going to be worth how expensive this is going to be to break if the subroutines fire, how good they are. And cards like border control and cards like pink kind of open up that space in a really meaningful way where you there's other things you care about and other ways that you're going to play the game. So we've been playing uh, on this channel. We did a couple streams with Nemec. Nemec is a, a, a person who builds their own cards and they made this really nice template to generate your own cards. And they released a set of like 400 plus cards and we played with them on the stream on Tabletop Simulator and on a Jinteki Mirror. And they had this whole subtype of called On Res, which was a subtype of cards. Mind you, this is not by any means an official Netrunner card. This is a fan project, so you don't get confused, but you can go ahead and print these if you want to. And it says when you res this ice and the run unless the runner loses a click. But basically there was a whole type of ice that did something cool when you res the ice. And I like this design because it not only makes you consider where you install your ice, but when you res them. And that's the idea, just like border control. There's more to playing ice. And I've heard in interviews from June, the lead designer on, on Nisei right now, that there's a problem with Netrunner ice uh, in the standard card pool. There's some ice that's just so good and so ubiquitously good that there's not a lot of decisions runners will make. The Engram Flush, I'll put it on just about any remote server. And if the runner runs it, I'll res it for two credits regardless of board state. Slot Machine is another uh, problem with this. You'll res these things no matter what, regardless of any conditions. That's it. You put it there, it's going to be taxing I res it. And there's no thought involved. And that's where things like this are really cool because there are some moments in the game where I choose not to res this just because I think I can make a situation where the runner runs this last click and then they can end their turn 
with a tag. Perhaps like this is so cool. There's sometimes a white space I'll install early or I'll draw late and I'll install it and I won't res it because the runners put down their buzzsaw, their decoder that breaks it for one credit. And I don't feel like that's a good trade for me. But with the existence of ping within system gateway, with let alone within the standard meta, any card that is unres, the runner might have to respect. I can't run that last click because if I do, I'll take a tag. And again, maybe bigger in the standard card pool, that tag could mean death. That's so cool. It's not just how good is the ice, do they have the breaker, but now it's when they run it. And I'm just such a big fan of that design where now you consider where you're placing your ice and when you're resing it as well. I think it's awesome. And there's going to be a lot of players that are going to build this ridiculous trap servers and goad the runner to run this in. Maybe you play Anoetic Void. So over and over again, you can force them to run this remote. And then on the last click, you res the ping and they end up with a tag and then you get them good with a Unfortunately, uh, it's retribution within System Gateway. But then you hit them with some cool tag punishment. Like there's some really cool plays to be had here. I'm a big fan of this design. On its own, it is what people call a cheap gear check ice. It forces a solution. If you want to res it, it does also have a, a face check penalty. They have to clear the tag. It works well in Reality Plus. Sign me up. This is so cool. Now, if you go outside of System Gateway, again, I think this is still a very relevant card and does open that interesting play space. On top of it, tag punishment is bigger and better in System Gateway. So that tag, and specifically resing at last click or resing when they don't have maybe enough money to clear the tag, that is pretty relevant. We see cards like Wraparound within standard format still, and this is a card that sees play because it's an early face check. It also does specifically have some good interactions against AI and non-fractors breaking this, where it has really big strength. And we saw this. This is TF34, second place at Worlds 2020. And they, uh, in the finals, there's some games where they're just jamming agendas behind a single Wraparound. And I, I think it might be possible to just put some pings in this list and call it a day and have even more face check penalties in the early game where the runner runs this and ends up with a tag and still has to deal with all these assets and clearing the tag. Now, again, in standard, if we had things like closed account, the tag punishment, the single tag punishment is a bit different. This did rotate. But again, cards like all seeing eyes are really big deal. In sync, ping is awesome because three credits will move that tag is amazing. You can play Harish Chandra, Harish Chandra. And really good. Again, positional ice. Put in front of the data ward. They're going to have a tag when you res it. And uh, Argus. We talked about those data raven decks. You could play this, maybe combine this with things like border control to ensure that you're ending the run. So they're running this later in the turn to get the tag, which you end up with some sort of death. You have false lead, just like tomorrow's headline. You can remove this when they run into the ping at the wrong time. It's so cool. And also with Funhouse, it's really nice. They go through the Funhouse, they take a tag, and then suddenly they take a second tag and they don't have two clicks left. Like this works really well together and two tags might be enough for boom. Another shout out, we talked about this before, but Divert Power, it actually works kind of well with ping. Ping is not that expensive to res. You can de-res your, your, uh, your, your ping, you can de-res your Spin Doctor and free res something for a lot more money. It's a fun combination. But I, I just really love the design on ping. I'm excited to like brew some decks with this that are trying to build these cool traps. And on its own, runners break this for one, which is fine. It's a gear check. It forces out a breaker. It has a real face check penalty and can be a real threat, even if not rezzed. And I love that idea that runners might be more scared of unrezzed ice than rezzed ice. If you say, run this remote, do you res? No. And now they're a bit more concerned. I think that's so cool. Predictive Planogram is the first operation we have. It costs nothing to play. God, these NBN cards are so easy to play. It's a transaction subtype that is relevant and says resolve one of the following. If the runner is tagged, you may resolve both instead. Sick. It says gain three credits or draw three cards for the best augmented reality shopping experience. Please disable tracking protection. Uh, one influence on this card. I didn't actually know what a planogram was, and a planogram is this sort of thing. It's this sort of chart or schematic that puts, uh, basically lays out where products are within generally a commercial space, either on a shelf level or the sort of macro level. A lot of thought, psychology, analysis goes into this because organizing things at a way that makes them sell better is obviously going to be very profitable. There's a really cool uh, video Vox put together. This is many years old now. The Hidden War of a Grocery Shelf Space. And it talks about the war of the costs associated with putting your products at different eye lines and how there's kind of cabals of, of companies paying top dollar for to ensure that they have the right placement. It's like really interesting. And this is the idea that, uh, that uh, I guess we predicted something. Please just disable tracking. I think that's the most important thing. Now this, again is a revisitation of some older cards. And it's a combination of two Netrunner cards, Anonymous Tip 
from the old core sets as zero, draw three cards, or for zero, if you want to play in Wayland, gain three credits. And this card says, make your choice. And that was an interesting thing. Anonymous Tip didn't see a lot of play, and Beanstalk didn't see a lot of play. But now having a card that says, two cards in one, choose the best for your situation, that will see a lot more play. And this is an interesting thing when it comes to a choice, like you might've been playing Wildcat Strike at this point and you realize that you always get the worst of two options because the your opponent chooses the worst of the two options. But that being said, the two options on Wildcat Strike are still pretty good. But the idea with Pladiga Brandigram is you can look at your board state and choose the best of two options. And that makes this card a lot more playable. The idea is having a three credit jump at zero is a really big deal. If you go down to zero credits, it's hard to get back into the game. It's hard to start making money. And this is the fastest you can get back to playing hedge funds, which is really nice. Draw three cards might be more enticing because there's less things that draw cards and there's more cards that give you money within System Gateway. So maybe you need that card draw to be able to throw things out at the end of your turn to ensure you're, ensure you're restoring humanity dollars. Or maybe you need more cards in hand for Anoetic Void or a Hansei Review. Maybe you just want to draw into your Mana Garm Skunk Works because you just need this right now to score in a remote server for zero credits, one influence. It's so easy to put this into any deck. On top of that, drawing mass amount of cards can be scary in Netrunner. If you end up drawing two agendas in the early game and you're not ready to score two agendas, uh, you got Spin Doctor and Spin Doctor is going to help you out. Spin Doctor can say, OK, you drew a lot. That's OK. Throw them out. I'll repair it. And it's such a nice combo when put together. Now, of course, if the runner is tagged, Predicted Planogram gets even better. You get both of these if you'd like to. And May is a very interesting thing. You're never forced to do both of the runner's tag. That is quite generous. A lot of times you will, but you can gain three credits and draw three cards. And that is just such a strong ability. We've seen this on cards before. Rashidi Yahim shows up in just about every uh, standard card, uh, standard deck. Violet level clearance is a very similar card and it's been banned, but that's really good. It's like a violet level clearance that you're not forced to play last click that you can play on zero credits. But I think the biggest part of this by far is that the runner is tagged. And if the runner is tagged, this is your mad dash to not only draw, but afford your punishment cards. Retribution is very easy to play on one credit, but now you can say like, oh, the runner's tagged, their turn is over, they hit a tomorrow's headline, I'll open with a planogram, and then I'll hit them with two retributions that I've drawn. Maybe I had one in hand. And that's really fun and exciting, and we haven't, I guess we talked about this a bit with Reality Plus. Reality Plus works largely the same way. That if the runner is tagged, it's always this excitement of, oh, I'm going to draw two and hope I find punishment. And that is quite something. That's it. I guess what I have to say about within System Gateway, it's just universally going to be good. There's a lot of times where I have some influence left over and just having a, an affordable way or a very affordable way to either burst draw, which seems really good right now in the Jinteki decks within System Gateway, or just to gain three credits off of zero. Like that's going to be good no matter what deck you put it in. And for zero, that's a fantastic. It's worth noting that the runner generally won't be tagged in most any other matchup besides. Uh, like It's unlikely. I don't think I would specifically put Funhouse within an NBN deck. Maybe in a Wayland deck, you could consider it where Retribution is in faction. But if I'm playing System Gateway, I would not expect Predictive Planogram to fire off of both. Like I, I don't think I'll get the tagged fire if I'm playing a Precision Design deck because I'm not going to be playing any of the tagging cards, maybe bar barring the Orbital Bombardment or Superiority, I think it's called. But even if you have no tagging in your deck, I think this is still a very relevant deck, a uh, relevant card. That's what I was trying to say. It's still good with no tags. Shortened it. I'll edit that out. Um, now, outside of it, I guess, outside of Gateway, um, we got to talk about building a better world, cares about transactions. It's a transaction. Um, and you're seeing this card again in a similar way. It's, it's a very flexible card, and I think a lot of decks can run it. Right now, if you look on Narrow DB, it's mostly yellow decks within System Gateway, but also you're seeing this show up in HB decks. And I think there's some really cool reasons why that would be. This is Doom Rats, Mirror Morph deck, and Mirror Morph is really cool. It's a really cool ability that incentivizes you to do three different things on your turn. And having a very playable zero cost operation to play on your turn gives you a lot of triggers for Mirror Morph. And I think that's quite cool. This is uh, Sokka's uh, Go Fast, Stay Home sports metal deck. And this sort of deck also, just having one influence left over, here is a card that will draw me three or gain three credits. Like, it's just universally good in a lot of decks. I want to draw a lot, and having money is pretty ubiquitous. It's also interesting, because we talked about tag punishment, single tag punishment. And a lot of times in the early game, if I'm playing against controlling the message, I'll trash turn one, maybe an asset, and take a tag. And I'll actually float that tag. Because having a single tag in the early game, there's not that much punishment. Like Boom and all the meat damage stuff cares about multiple tags. 
Cards like All Seeing Eye and Exchange of Information care about certain board states. And this is one of the only cards that just like ubiquitously tempo good on the early game. So maybe, and I think this is hard because competitive CTM decks have very tight slots, but the idea is that if you float a tag early game, oh, cool, predict a planogram. I'm going to draw three, gain three, and now I have more money and more cards to spam on the table. I think that's cool. And again, just about any identity that cares about tags could consider this. Any identity that is building towards a board state in which you ensure the runner is going to be tagged. Things like sync, where you have a lot of cards to tag the runner. Uh, that can be something because then you have a card that will draw you into your tag punishment and close the game out quickly. That is quite nice. On top of that, again, just like I said before, any deck could consider spending one influence to be able to draw three or gain three, whatever is better for them, even if tags aren't relevant. And I think you're going to see that. I think you're going to see that a fair, well, I don't know, maybe not a fair bit, but uh, I'm always considering it. If I'm seeing a deck and I have one influence left over after I played all my three spin doctors, I actually, I do look at this a fair bit, even though it might not be the most flashy card. I'm a big fan. And hey, there was a problem here because the runner did turn their tracking off and we ended up here. A public trail. I'm going to apologize straight up at the front. If I ever call this card public trial, I mean public trail. It happens. I don't know what to say. Uh, it costs four. It's a gray ops operation. That subtype gray ops is really fun. I don't think there's any card in the card pool that cares about that subtype. It's just flavor for now. It says play only if the runner made a successful run during their last turn. Give the runner one tag unless they pay eight credits. What? And just some flavor text that says a runner uses significant resources scrubbing their traces. Every cycle, it's harder to pin them down, but the game changes. In Highline, no one can last a day without brushing our AR network. Signed, Cassie La Rosa Lunar Net Defense Sysop. This is a reimagining of an existing card called Sea Source. And Sea Source is a very similar idea. Play only if the runner made a successful run during their last turn, but Sea Source also gave the runner a tag, but it was conditionally attached to a trace. Again, we talked a bit about traces. Basically, the corporation and the runner threw money at each other. And if the corporation ended up paying more money, the runner would end up with a trace. Sea Source was originally meant to be one of the two cards, or technically four cards, reprinted within System Gateway. Currently, the only cards reprinted in System Gateway that are existing Netrunner cards are Sure Gamble and Hedge Fund. But Sea Source was meant to be there. And uh, June actually wrote this article back in. March, January, February, March, yeah, uh, called Without a Trace, explaining that the designers, June themselves, uh, decided to remove Trace from, from uh, the system gateway card pool just to make it, again, more approachable. There was less overhead, less mechanics to learn. It was easier to get into the game. And Sea Source was replaced with Public Trail. And Public Trail, did I do it already? Um, is a very interesting revision of sea source and I, I i think it's it's a lot cleaner you don't have to worry about trace and it largely does the same thing that you wanted to do anyways in sea source so the basic idea is that the runner has run which they're going to do you pay four credits and then the runner either takes a tag or pays eight credits now if you're ahead as the corporation and you pay four credits and the runner loses eight credits that's immense that is a lot of money there's not a lot of runners that will have more than 20 credits within System Gateway. Uh, even I think if the runner has 20 credits, they lose eight credits. Like that's a huge hit. A lot of times runners will be floating between nine and 12 credits. If they lose eight credits, that's awful. It's also worth knowing it doesn't say eight credits if able. So, uh, oh wait, unless they pay eight credits. So they need at least, excuse me, they need at least eight credits. They can't pay up to this. They can't just pay what they have. So if they have seven credits, they're going to have to take a tag. Now, if they do take a tag, of course, reality plus fires, and that's quite nice. And this is actually a really cool card because all the other cards we've talked about so far, cards like Ping and cards like Funhouse, only have the ability to trigger on the runner's turn when they're running through your ice. And Public Trail is really cool because it's one of the ways that you can tag the runner on the corporation's turn. And NBN and reality plus will trigger their ability first time a turn. So that's the corpse and the runners. So having cards that trigger on the runner's turn, or sorry, on the corpse turn, is very good for you. So the idea is a lot of times public trail might only cost you two credits, or you pay four credits to give the runner a tag, and then you draw two cards. Both of those are pretty good. We've talked about a lot of times giving the runner a tag and then having two card draws really nice if you need to find the cards that can interact with that tag. Now, public trail, again, 
giving the runner a tag, paying four credits or two credits to give the runner a tag is quite nice. Again, we talked about the three tag punishment cards and they kind of range in value. Uh, again, this is one of the easiest ways to take down a resource if you really want to. You can spend two clicks and four credits in Reality Plus if you get the two credit refund to trash a verbal plasticity. That's one of the resources I think I'm most interested in trash in. It's also a card that you can play right before you score out an orbital superiority. You can do advance, advance. If you've already installed double advanced it, give the runner a tag, score this, do four damage. That's cool. But again, that's kind of the problem right now in System Gateway is that the tag punishment isn't that big of a deal. I feel like the worst part about Public Trail would be losing eight credits. If the option was the, the corporation retributioning one of my breakers or losing eight credits on the spot, I would almost always say you can retribution the breaker. And that's, again, the recurring theme it comes with NBN within System Gateway is that I don't think the tags are scary enough. Uh, that I would honestly be okay. I don't want to pay eight credits. You can pay four uh, to, 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 and then more time and more credits to retribution me. That's generally okay. And that's also a problem. If the runner, if you decide or you're basically forced to go tag me and not care about how many tags you have, uh, not only do does the ice fall apart a bit, perhaps, but now every public trail that the corporation draws is largely a dead card, unless the corporation is okay with paying four credits to draw two cards. Otherwise, it's useless. And that's a bummer when you draw these when the runner's like seven or eight tags and you're like, oh, this feels bad. That being like, that's going to happen no matter what. Uh, if you draw your fun houses, you're going to feel bad too. So yeah, that's something worth keeping in mind if the runner does go tag me. Now, eight credits is actually a really interesting number because it lines up with hard hitting news, which is the strongest tag based uh, threat within the standard card pool. And hard hitting news is a similar idea. It requires a runner to may have made a run, not a successful run, but just made a run during their last turn. And then trace four is attached to the runner taking four tags. And a lot of times within the standard card pool, Runners will make sure that they end their turn with at least eight credits when playing against a deck that they expect to have hard-hitting news in, within, in it. And that is because that even if the corporation spends a lot of money and the runner can't beat the trace, uh, the trace four and they end up taking four tags, with eight credits, you can always clear all four tags. Obviously, that's a huge tempo hit that you're spending eight credits, let alone your whole turn, to clear four tags. That means that when the corpse turn next turn starts, you won't have any tags and they can't punish you with any tag punishment. So a lot of times remembering to play against a CTM, controlling the message or sync decks while you have eight credits, I guess for sync, it's a bit different, is like a good thing to learn anyways. And it's kind of cool that Public Trail is, is teaching the newer runners to System Gateway to remember that number eight. Now, another card that comes up a lot with hard hitting news and in standard card pool, you could consider playing this as economic warfare. You can play economic warfare to make the runner go below eight credits. Maybe they were on eight credits and then suddenly supplies them, surprise them with a public trail that they can't avoid to ensure that they have a single tag. And I think that's a thing you could consider doing in standard card pool. But for me right now, at least, if I'm playing an economic warfare deck, maybe I'm playing Wayland. Uh, I'd rather just give them the hard hitting news, which is four tags. Now, obviously, the difference with public trials, you can give them a tag and then interact with the tag on the same turn. A hard hitting news, you have to wait till the next turn and hope they can't clear the tags. And generally, if you economic warfare at them, it's pretty hard to do that. Now, again, in standard card pool, public trail is a lot scarier because there is a lot. There are a lot more cards that interact with a single tag more favorably. Exchange of information is just the biggest deal. If you have it set up where you've scored a one pointer, the corporation or sorry, the runner has stolen a three point agenda. If they have less than eight credits, you can do public trial into exchange. And if that public trial, if they pay eight credits, you're generally OK with that anyways, because if they have less money, they can't run your remote and do all the other stuff they wanted to do. So that's a really big deal. Exchange of information is really, uh, really rude. All seeing eye potentially can be a big blowout as well. Sync, also a possibility, is technically more credits to remove that tag if they want to. Maybe they're more likely to pay eight. And again, you can always do public trail. They pay eight credits, maybe if they really are scared. And now that they have eight fewer credits, you hit them with a hard-hitting news. Again, they've ran last turn, right? So you could do public trail into hard-hitting. That's super rude. Public trail also. Um, and maybe in Harishandra specifically, if you've seen their hand, if you do click one public trail and they've not paid eight, they can't pay eight. You can see their hand and now focus group is alive because you can make a perfect play and fast advance a card based on what they have in hand. Maybe Salem's hospitality is a lot easier. It's interesting. It's like Sea Source was also in the meta for a while before it rotated. And for the last couple of years, it didn't see a lot of play just because the single tag punishment in the game was nowhere near as strong as a multi-tag punishment in the game. 
If the runner has taken multiple tags from hard hitting news, they'll die if they keep at least two to boom. So a lot more times this sort of hard hitting news play was much more common in competitive decks than sea source. And I think for the same reason, public trail is a bit different, uh, a bit more uh, difficult. That being said, losing eight is a huge thing. And if you have a constant single tag threat, you can make the runner lose a lot of money or at least force them to go tag me. Now, as a runner, there's ways to deal with this. No one home, one influence, zero cost is an easy way to trace your weight out of a tag. That seemed pretty scary. Citadel Sanctuary is also kind of nice. It lets you remove that tag eventually for free and prevent meat damage. Not the perfect answer. And On the Lamb is also quite nice. It lets you uh, dodge a tag, albeit expensive and requires some setup. But uh, it's, if you're scared about this sort of card and you're dealing with decks that are really punishing you, uh, these cards work relatively well. And they also do work against hard hitting news, which is a nice way to cover yourself, your multiple bases at once. I think our last NBN card here, this is Amaze Amusements. It is an upgrade. It's a fun type of card. It costs one credit. It's unique. And it says persistent, which is a reminder of a new keyword that's been introduced within System Gateway. And it says whenever a run on the server ends, if the runner stole any agendas during that run, give the runner two tags. And there's just a clarification on what persistent means. It means that the runner trashes this card while accessing it. This ability still applies for the remainder of this run. So if you run this remote server, trash the maze amusements, and then steal an agenda in the same run, you're still going to end up with two tags. Free commemorative souvenir is a really good flavor text. One to res, three to trash is also a pretty good ratio. So I'm assuming with the amusements name and the idea that there's a start at the top, that this is supposed to be some of this, this like spiral slide, which I'm not convinced is a real thing outside of Roller Coaster Tycoon, but I guess the rings are, they're, they're like perfectly concentric. They're not spiraling, but I think that's what this, this is what I think of when I look at this. It looks like a funhouse slide, right? And this persistent keyword is also something that has showed up before, but hadn't had a keyword attached to it. Red herrings was the same idea. It costs, it made agendas five credits more expensive to steal. And this would stick around if the if the runner trashed it. That ability would be consistent throughout the run or persistent. And it's cool that they have a, a, a name for this. I'm wondering if Netrunner is going to get closer to magic where they can just put persistent and not have the subtext, the explainer text. I, I think for a system gateway, it makes a lot of sense, let alone this is the first time we've seen that. But um, I'm interested to see in the future whether that's the case. So defensive uh, upgrades for agendas are kind of neat. And defensive might not be the right term for this. This is technically an offensive upgrade. But the first thing I want to flag with this is that the 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 text on this is actually really um it's really good for the corporation. This says whenever a run on the server ends, if the runner stole any agendas, give the runner two tags. And we've seen cards like this before. I think Ben Musashi is a good um example. And Ben Musashi is a similar idea. One to three, res the trash cost. And it says each time the runner accesses an agenda from the server, they must suffer two net damage as an additional cost in order to steal it. So Ben Musashi says this is an additional cost to steal the agenda. A mace just says, here's two tags. And that's important because if any card has an additional cost to steal, the runner can refuse to steal it. So if the runner runs into an Obakata protocol on its own because it has an additional cost to steal it, the runner must suffer four net damage. The runner can refuse to steal it. And that's interesting because if there's a sting in the remote server and uh, on top of a Ben Musashi, it's not like the runner is going to hit the sting, have to steal it, take the sting damage, take the Ben Musashi damage and flatline. Ben Musashi makes this net damage an additional cost so the runner can refuse to steal the sting. And that's what I really like about Amaze Amusements. You're stealing the agenda, you're taking the tag. You can't, it's not an additional cost. You can't refuse to be like, oh no, thank you. I don't want to be tagged. So you have to take the tags. And that's really cool for a card like this because most of the other defensive persistent cards were defensive and gave the runner choices. There's no choice evolved here. This is a cool card. The early game, you want to jam out agendas, an off-world office on this in solid advance if the runner runs it. Again, if you're playing Reality Plus, you're going to get two cards, two credits, and they suddenly have two tags. And if they don't have two clicks left, and sometimes in the early game, it's hard to have two clicks left, where they have to install a breaker, run the remote, maybe they played a, a sure gamble first click, they're going to end up with a tag. And again, tag punishment, and this is unfortunately such a bummer, it's not that strong within System Gateway. So I don't think that's that big of a deal, but that's really cool. There's a lot of situations in which the runner runs a remote server, is unsure what a face down card is, and suddenly they have tags. On top of that, you can combine this with other things like tomorrow's headline, which makes it's a three tag steal and ping, sometimes even a four tag steal. You can make a lot of situations where you can ensure that the runner is going to have a tag when your turn starts. Now, it's worth noting, of course, Reality Plus is only the first time a turn the runner takes a tag, so you're going to be technically leaving value on the table. I don't actually believe that, 
But the idea is that you're not going to be getting this four times over. You're only going to be getting it once. And that is a big deal. Now, I think out of any card in System Gateway, this is one of the cards that makes me go tag me the most likely. If I run into an early Amaze Amusements and I'm not prepared for it, I'm just going to go tag me. And that's such a big deal because now I don't have to deal with their ice, most of the NBN ice. I don't have to deal with the public trails, but I also don't have to deal with trashing this thing or respecting it in the future. It's now a dead card, an entirely dead card. I've talked about this earlier in, in the video, but if you can add a single card to the system gateway to iron out these issues, I would add psychographics because now the amount of tags that the runner has, you can directly, uh, you can alchemize it into a win condition. And I, I think that's awesome. So now it actually matters. If they have six tags, you're suddenly scoring cards out of hand, like, or agendas out of hand, like nobody's business. And again, I think this just falls into this, this uh, kind of issue. Another thing with Amazed Amusements is that it doesn't protect anything besides agendas. You can always install this on R&D, HQ, even archives, and if the runner accesses the top of R&D and you've res the Maze Amusements, they still have to take two tags. Now, they might not hit an agenda, and if they don't hit an agenda, the Maze Amusements does nothing, and then they can choose to pay three credits to trash this before it actually matters. But it is worth noting that it is installable anywhere. The remote server is technically the place you can most usually ensure that it is an agenda. But uh, maybe just its existence is scary enough to runners who don't want to be tagged. The idea is that you could even install like a, a Nico campaign on an Amaze Amusements and they might not run it because they think it's an agenda until you res it. Like that's kind of neat. Admittedly though, this card does nothing if there's no agenda in the remote server with it. So that's a problem with the Maze Amusements. Just the tags, I don't think are that scary. But uh, on its own and outside of, excuse me, outside of System Gateway, I think that can get very relevant very quickly. With Sync, you run the remote server, that's six credits worth of tags to remove. That's absurd. That is such a big amount of tags. That's a lot of money. Controlling the message on top of that, again, uh, you have to take the agenda, take a tag from this. If you want to trash the maze amusements, that's three credits on top of a trace for, for another tag. That can get really difficult. Now, you could consider playing this in Argus Security. It's, what, three influence? Three influence is a lot. But the idea is that you want to tag the runner. You have a lot of agendas. Maybe board of controls can ensure that they interact with this later in the turn. And if they run last click into Maze Amusements, maybe uh, they take a tag from Argus Security and then they have three tags and boom fires. Maybe they take Argus damage and then two tags from Maze Amusements and then a high profile target kills them. There's a lot of things you can do. Overseer Matrix is also really neat to protect it within Wayland. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, I think the biggest thing that you can... Uh, compare that sort to this is Prysec. And Prysec has the same trash cost. It's zero to res, but every time as a corp you want to fire this, you pay two credits to do a single tag and a single meat damage. And I feel like a lot of these decks with Argus would probably just save the influence and play Prysec because Prysec is a lot more flexible because it doesn't matter if there's agenda in the remote server, let alone if the runner's stealing the agenda. You can put this anywhere and generally get value. That is worth knowing. It says whenever run on the server ends if the runner stole any agendas. So if you're playing system gateway or without and you're playing, say, you're playing Lou and then you have something like a carnivore out, you can always trash the agenda. So you run the remote server, fire Lou's carnivore, throw out two cards, and now the agenda is in archives and then you're not worried about the maze amusements because you didn't steal it. And then you can run archives and steal it. I think that's re really relevant. And within standard card pool, you have things like imp as well. So if you're not stealing the agenda, it'll never fire. And that's another big reason why Prysec is a lot more flexible. It doesn't care about anything besides you accessing this. And you have to access all cards. And that's all the NBN cards. We still have two neutral cards to go through. But just talking about these cards, like uh, I'm, I'm worried I'm sounding a bit like a broken record to some extent. But unfortunately, a lot of these cards that give tags don't line up too well to me, uh, for me, because I feel like the tags within System Gateway aren't that relevant. Again, there's only three cards that deal with tags specifically. I don't think Retribution is that scary. There is a chance maybe if you just keep playing this card over and over again and aggressively putting it back into your deck with Spin Doctor, maybe at that point it will become problematic. But at that point, you have a lot of time to remove the tags if it really gets out of hand. And again, as a runner, you have to play around this intelligently. You have to keep extra copies of Breakers if you're worried about uh, Retribution. Maybe that's why you should play Urtica Cypher, right? Just to get damage in your NBN deck to get cards out of hand. But again, there's just so many ways to, to, to break ice within system gateways. It's, it's kind of hard. A Reality Plus, though, I, I think it's so cool that this is one of the few identities in the game that gets value even if the runner goes tag me. I love that design. I, I think that's so cool because thematically, uh, NBN still, even if they know where you are, they just make more money the more that you involve them. You involve yourself as a runner within their network, which is great. 
Tomorrow's headline, really strong 3-2. You're going to see this just about everywhere. It's such a good ability and it's a scary trap. And its existence is so hard to play around as a one of. Spin Doctor is one of the best cards in the whole set. It's so flexible. It's going to be a three of in every competitive deck going forward for a really long time. And I, I don't see why that wouldn't be the case. One influence, it lets you play the game. It, it lets you play better Netrunner. I'm a big fan of it. I think Ping is really fun. Funhouse, I think, is a worse Data Raven, unfortunately. Uh, and again, uh, outside of System Gateway, though, an on-encounter ability is not... You don't want to scoff at that. That is really cool. That is a uh, tax that's always going to be outside of the question of breakers. Um, that's really cool. I'm a, I'm a bigger fan of Planogram, I think, than a lot of people. I think it's really flexible and good. Public Trail, I don't know if it's going to see a lot of play um, over hard-hitting news, but in theory, if there's a really strong single-tag punishment, then so be it. And Amazing Amusements is a, it can be a really mean card if you're not expecting it. I've been tagged and buried in Standard uh, pretty soon in the game, and then you die very quickly. And again, I think if you can add one card to System Gateway and it just blows up Reality Plus's ability, maybe you could put some meat damage from standard format. I think just a single Psychographics or two would be such a big deal. But I think one of the strongest things, or one of the, not the strongest, one of the most notable things is that the Nisei designers are changing the values of a tag. And I like this. As much as I'm kind of dunking on the value of a tag or single tag or multiple tags, the old core sets tags, a single tag was death. Closed accounts was just such a big problem. Uh, it would it would just knock you out of the game, but even bigger, Scorched Earth is just such a problem in the old core sets. A single tag means a lot of times you're dead. And I like it that there's more granularity that you, you care more about how many tags you have and the value of those tags on different board states than just, oh, you're dead. I res ping, right? I, I think that's really cool. And again, psychographics and these sort of cards that care about how many tags you have, I'm a big fan of it. I find myself a lot of times ending up playing like multiple copies of the Anoetic Void in my System Gateway NBN decks just because they struggle to find a way to close the game. And I think if the runner realizes that they can go tag me a lot of the times, it gets a lot harder when your ice falls apart. But that's the NBN cards. We have two more neutral cards to talk about. And this is one of the cards that deals with tags uh, that we haven't talked about yet. And understanding what it does is really important for evaluating tags within System Gateway. It's orbital superiority for advancement for two agenda points. It's a security subtype that I don't think matters. It says when you score this agenda, if the runner is tagged, do four meat damage. Oof. Otherwise, give the runner one tag. Mobsters bribe police. Megacorps acquire militaries. And Kremble has some really nice art of uh, somebody getting rocketed from space on the moon. So there's like a uh, kind of a tradition in core sites. You got to put a mediocre 4-2 agenda that cares about tags. This is the old private security force. Uh, it says if the runner was tagged, you basically get them in this lock where you just say meet damage, meet damage, meet damage. And either they have to clear the tags or just spend the next turn drawing. And then the game kind of gets really awkward. And we've also seen other cards like this. This is the very, uh, I've never seen this card played. Uh, this is Meteor Mining, a 5-2 Wayland agenda when scored gains 7 credits. But if the runner has at least 2 tags, you may do 7 meat damage instead. I've got a rock, a fun uh, reference to original Netrunner. And then we have Armed Intimidation, which gives the runner a choice on a 4-2 score. Either take 5 meat damage or take 2 tags, which is a kind of similar ability in some ways to Orbital Superiority. So Orbital Superiority, if you're playing it as a 4-2 agenda, when you score it, you give the runner a tag. And that's nice. Just in Reality Plus, if you score it out, you can basically make it a 2-2 two -two agenda in some ways, right? Because uh, you score it out, you get two credits back. That's pretty naive. The clicks are more important than the credits a lot of times. But you get a refund, draw two cards. So it's, it's never blank. Also, you do give the runner a tag, just like tomorrow's headline. So the runner has to clear that tag. And that's going to cost them two credits and a click. So there is actually a pretty big swing on tempo as long as the runner is not going tag me. Now, because System Gateway has a limited amount of agendas, this agenda shows up in just about, I think, every deck you can build in System Gateway, or at least every deck I have built in System Gateway, just because there's a limited agenda pool. And this is the one agenda that I almost never score unless I have to. Just because every other agenda in my precision design deck is going to be a lot better for me. Obviously, Luminal Transubstantiation, Offworld Office is a really strong 4-2, Send a Message is a strong 5-3, and this one just gives the runner a tag. So this is the agenda that I'm generally throwing out and putting back into my deck with Spin Doctor and hoping I never have to score it because it just does the least amount of stuff within most System Gateway games. It's a bit different if you're playing Reality Plus because then you have cards that generally interact with the tags. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's pretty underwhelming outside of faction. Now, an interesting thing about Orbital Superiority as a 4-2 is that you can give the runner a tag and if you score it with interesting patterns, you actually have clicks left to, to, to 
use those tags, right? The idea is that if you maybe seamless launch this out, you do install advance, advance, and then next turn you do seamless launch score, you'll have two tags, or sorry, you have two clicks and the runner will have a tag. So you can do cool things like retribution and you'll have that click to also maybe predict a planogram first. You can time this to score it so you have clicks left to ensure that you can capitalize on the runner being tagged. And that's a really strong way to play orbital superiority. That's also a line of play that you have access to if you are playing this and you probably are playing this in other decks within System Gateway is that if you install Advance Advance it, next turn you can do Advance Advance score and then maybe trash a resource. Um, again, that's a very expensive line of play, but you can do it. Now, the beauty here is if the runner is tagged. And again, that was one of the weaknesses of the strategy we talked about, and maybe we should have talked about this sooner, is that if the runner is tagged, there's very little I think a corp can do outside of retribution within System Gateway. And Orbital Superiority is a real threat. If they score this and you have less than three cards in hand, you're just dead, and there's nothing to do. There's nothing to do about that. And so I think one of the things you do have to keep in mind when playing against an uh, NBN deck is if you're going to tag me is to make sure you never end with less than three cards in hand. And that's honestly not that hard to do. This is not a format that has something like snare in it, where you run archives, run sorry, not archives, you run R&D or HQ, hit a snare, end your turn with a tag and less cards in hand, and then you die to an orbital superiority. Generally, there's no damage that you're going to take outside of accessing an Urtica cipher, which is something, uh, it could happen. But basically, it's it's less likely. You're generally going to be in good control of how many cards you have in your hand. And this is also the issue is that if the runner is going tag me and is floating a lot of tags as an NBN deck, it's hard for you to score an agenda because a big part of your ice suite cares about the runner being tagged. It's hard to score agendas behind fun houses when the fun houses are almost entirely blank, barring your reality plus ability. So it's kind of hard. Like you need to get this on the table. You need to protect it. Still, the runner has to go tag me and you have to score it. And I feel a lot of times I'll just run everything if. I'm gone tag me because a lot of the ice isn't that good. I guess the only thing is I can't really rely on economy resources, but you can get away with that. Now, there are some cool play patterns. Maybe you install advanced advanced this. Maybe you don't have seamless launch. Maybe the runner has ran. Maybe they're not going tag me and you can play public trail. You can do public trail advance, advance score, and then suddenly they take four damage. That's actually a really real thing. That is one reason where I would consider paying eight credits is if I think that there is an orbital superiority on the table and I have less than four cards in hand. That is one of the times where Public Trail has some real teeth within this format, is that if there's a card in remote server brewing, and maybe that's a way for Public Trail, you just put an Urtica Cypher, double advance it, and then you incentivize the runner to always spend eight. That can be pretty good for you. Also, if the runner is tagged, you can score orbital superiority and then hit them with a Nero spike. And that's a six damage play, which can be quite nice. But again, it is hard to score it. This is also one of the big reasons why, like, I think psychographics would be such a big deal in System Gateway, because if the runners tag me, you can install psychographics for four, score an orbital and do four make damage out of nowhere, which would be quite nice. But it's an agenda that does technically give you some tempo. There is a tempo swing when you score it in Reality Plus. In all the other identities, unless you have a click left, it's a pretty bad tempo agenda. Just give the runner a tag for a 4-2. It just feels so much worse than potentially scoring out something like an off-world office, which gives you seven. So it's kind of a bummer when you score it. I generally try not to score it as much as possible because it is low in tempo. But in reality, plus it can be neat. There's some cool combo plays if you can build around it, things with like public trail and neurospike. You can kind of set something up in some situations, but otherwise it is a bit underwhelming. Now, the interesting thing is also we've seen cards like Meteor Mining, right? Like it's a very similar idea is that if the runner is tagged and you can score this, you can do an immense amount of damage. And the problem with these sort of cards is that like if the runner has at least two tags, like I could just play boom and do seven damage and not have to spend five clicks and protecting an agenda. That's kind of the issue as soon as you get into the standard card pool is that playing orbital superiority, if the runner is tagged, you're actually pretty close to doing things like boom and high profile target. And sure, there's no card. I don't think right now in the standard format will that will do four meat damage if the runner has a single tag. So maybe you have to do some sort of fast event shenanigans uh, in NBN or in maybe like Jemison Astronautics to get this thing to be really scary. But that deck still has access to that, um, to, uh, excuse me, to Armed Intimidation. And that seems a bit better. So I, I don't see how this would see any play within the standard format because just tag punishment is a lot better than this within standard format, especially when the tag punishment offers death in a much cleaner package than a 4-2 agenda you still need to protect and score. Lastly, let's talk about white space. It is a code gate. It costs two to res, has zero strength, no influence, full neutral. It's two subroutines. The runner loses three credits 
And if the runner has six credits or less, end the run. And such beautiful flavor text, the space intentionally left blank. Great art, again, by Scott Aminga. Um, this is really cool. I'm a big fan of this code gate. And it reminds me of one of the most popular Netrunner cards, Enigma. Enigma is a very similar ice. It is something that's very affordable in the early to mid game. A lot of times Enigma always ends the run. Sometimes white space doesn't, but it's an early card uh, that you can jam agendas in, in the early game um, behind. And if the runner hits it, there's a pretty big face check penalty. Losing a click is a really strong loss, especially in the early game where the runner wants to set up and contest your remote server. And losing three credits is a huge subroutine. That is a way stronger subroutine than I thought I would see on an ice that costs two. That is one of the strongest subroutines to ice cost ratios in the game. The last time we saw something like that, this is Toll Booth. And sure, Toll Booth, this is an on encounter ability, not a subroutine, so it shouldn't be seen the same way. But losing three credits is that's a lot of money in System Gateway, let alone outside of it. We have seen Data Pike before, and Data Park was only two credits, and this card didn't see a lot of play, but I think Code Gates were a bit weaker back in the day. Um, I'm a big fan of this. This is one of the biggest face checks in the early game of Netrunner in System Gateway. I don't know why I had to say Netrunner there. A lot of times I am more worried about face checking into a white space, a neutral card, than I am hitting two net damage with Karuna. Because again, in Netrunner, you need money to play money to make money. Like if you don't have a lot of money, you're not going to be installing breakers. You're not going to be making runs. You're not going to be playing your econ cards. A lot of times I'm more worried about losing three credits, especially in the early game again, than hitting Karuna. And this actually makes it one of the scariest face checks within System Gateway for a very affordable two credit package. Now, this, these subroutines are also very interesting. The runner loses three credits. If the runner has six credits or less end the run, there are a lot of turns in the early game where if I'm saying I'm playing sure gamble click one, click two before I run, I might want to click for a credit. And that is not always necessary, but the idea is if the runner is on 10 credits, you can always run the white space and it won't end the run. Because if you're on 10 and you lose three, you'll be at seven, which is greater than six. So this won't end the run. So face checking when you're at 10 credits specifically is a very magic number when it comes to white space. And it is worth remembering because white space will show up in just about every system gateway deck considering it's a neutral code gate and it's quite good for the cost. Now white space does fall apart a bit. And again, when you register for two, you're not that upset about it because runners will break this for one to two credits. Unity gets through it for one to two credits. Buzzsaw gets through it for one credit. And a very important thing to know is that the runner has seven or more credits. They only have to break the first subroutine and the second one does nothing. That's very similar to Enigma, where if you run last click, which can be scary in some decks, you don't have to break the first subroutine if you don't have a click to lose. And so that's very relevant. It's a very interesting, strong face check, and you're very incentivized to make sure the runner hits this early because a three credit loss before they find their breaker is a lot of money. So getting a white space on a remote server, maybe before or after a palisade, can be quite rude. It's one of the best ice to, to jam out behind. Admittedly, if the runner has 10 credits, it's not going to do too much. And that's again, I said this before, it's a cool thing about code gates. Uh, code gates don't consistently end the run within system gateway. They're generally conditional, and I don't know if that's intentional from Nisei. I expect it is. And, and, and this is, I think, the easiest to play. I'm not a big fan of Diviner, and Funhouse has some issues. Again, if you don't have tag punishment, it's not a very great thing to import into a lot of decks. You generally need tag punishment. And if the runner goes tag me, it does nothing besides give them two tags, which might not matter. So white space has a really nice spot as a neutral code gate that sometimes will force out a breaker. Even if the runner doesn't have a breaker, they could run through this, but losing three credits every time to go through it is a lot worse than paying one with Buzzsaw or one with Unity. And will this see play outside of System Gateway? I think there, it might. This is a CTM list and this deck runs Enigma as like an early face check to jam things behind that are important that you want to protect. Maybe some early Beals or a Tomorrow's Headline. And I think you could consider replacing in this deck, uh, what's it called? Um, Enigmas with white spaces. And that's because white space actually works pretty well. These sort of decks generally are taxing our runners a lot in terms of just early economy. They need to trash some of these resources, then controlling the message does a trace. And then on top of that, you want to clear the tag or beat the trace. So hitting early into something that robs you three credits might actually be a substantial hit. On top of that, if the runner has run and has lost three credits, cards like hard hitting news that care about interaction are going to be a lot more likely to land. And that seems kind of cool. If the runner's also at low credits, maybe you're pressuring them with, uh, with if they're tagged with things like market forces to lower the credits, like both subroutines suddenly become relevant. And I think that's quite cool. 
I think there's a possibility that some aggressive decks might want to play it. The problem though is this ice does entirely fall off. And if the runner has a lot of money, it also does fall off. But lose three credit subroutine is a lot. It also works well with game nets. Again, if the runner uh, loses credits during a run, and if this fires, not only do they lose three, you gain one, which is quite nice. And I think one of the things that is always worth saying in any zero strength ice is Amakua gets through it really easily. You don't need any, uh, you don't need any uh, strength boosts. You're good to go, which is a problem. Sometimes zero strength ice can be a liability in a world with a lot of Amakua, which largely it isn't right now because there's a lot of cyberdeck sandbox and virus hate. And again, important to know, you don't have to break both subroutines. You can always botulist the first subroutine, or sorry, botulist the second subroutine and lose three. It's also not lose three credits if able. So if you have less than three credits, you're still going to lose all of them. Uh, that's worth noting. That's a bit different than the ice on the toll booth. This says must pay three if able. So if you have two or one or zero, you will still lose as much money as you have. So do pay in mind. I, I think it's good. I, I think a lot of times in the mid to late game, I, if I draw this, I probably won't install it because installing this for a click, generally spending one or two credits to install an ice, and then they break it for one credit with Unity or Buzzsaw feels bad. But maybe that's this is where we build for a better future. I think it's cool ice. I think this could see play in standard. Uh, I think that face check is, is very, very legitimate. And that is all the cards we are reviewing today. Um, I hope I don't sound like too much of a bummer on this NBN stuff. I think the NBN cards, again, like most NBN cards, are really, really fun. Uh, they're really fun to play. I think admittedly, though, there still is a problem when it comes to the value of the tags. And I think a lot of runners can just go tag me and probably get away with it as long as they play it cleanly enough, largely around retribution. Maybe I need to play a deck that just like recurs retribution at, at infinitum with things like Spin Doctor. Maybe that will be scary. But NBN is really fun. And there's some of the strongest cards out of the whole system gateway in terms of standard card pool. Spin Doctor is just going to be such a big thing you're going to see forever. And tomorrow's headline is also going to be around forever, too, which is it's quite something. Yo, I'm really interested to know what you think, how, what your experiences are playing with System Gateway. Also, getting introduced in NBN is always really fun. Um, if there's any combinations or any sort of decks or archetypes you're excited to play, any combos, let me know in the description, or it's not in the description, in the, in the comments. I read all that stuff and reply to as much as, as I can. It's really appreciated. Also, if you like this sort of content and you enjoyed this and you watched through all of it, well done. These things are really long. Uh, if you want to like this video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. That does help us grow. Just spend a click and two credits to remove the tag. Or don't. It's System Gateway. You'll be fine, right? That's largely it. We'll be streaming a weekend on this channel. We stream Thursday nights at 45 Eastern. We'll love to drop, uh, to have you drop in on that if you can or watch the VOD. And otherwise, we'll be continuing. We have just the last runner cards to talk about Shaper. That should be up in a week or two. And otherwise, we'll see you soon, we hope. Take care. Ciao.